All right, let's rise for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, um, which it stands under God, nation. Welcome to the September 19th City Council meeting. <clears throat> Move on to uh, our council committee reports. John, remotely, welcome. Uh, can you give us Thank our you. finance committee report, sir? Yes, we can. I have a number of items that have gone along with the budget and finance committee here over the last 30 days. We started our budget process on August the 21st with a general discussion of the 23 budget. On September the 8th of 22, we had a, a, another budget meeting with my committee and one of my other council members, actually a couple others showed up uh, to talk about departmental budgets. We had in that discussion, the fire department, police department, public works, engineering, health and parks. Um, we also had a meeting last Wednesday, September the 14th and items on the budget tonight to consider uh, that we recommended to move forward to council for their consideration. Item 7B on the consent agenda Item 13, 14, and 15, 13 and 14 with respect to and Ready Motorsports. I with respect to Steven Auto. Item 16, 17, 18, and 19 with respect to the next phase of the Fishers District. Um, item 19 uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, the, the next phase of the district. Also, item 20 regarding the City Hall Municipal Project. Item 21 and 22 with respect to starting the process on the 96 and Allisonville funding project for that, that development. And item 23 and 24, along with 25 with regard, regarding to the sewer apartment. And lastly, item 26, we did recommend to move forward tonight to have first reading for our municipal budget for 2023. All right, thank you, sir, appreciate it. Moving yes, on sir. to item six is department report for health department report. You can find that on our Fisher's website. Uh, they uh, provide updates monthly for us. We want a consent agenda. Do I have Council a President Zimmerman, real yes. quick, yes. Uh, just a brief announcement. First of all, thank you for adjusting and, and coming here at 5.30. It's not every day we have 30 items on our agenda, so we appreciate that. And although we did our best to accommodate, there are a couple adjustments on the agenda that I'd ask um, for your consideration for right now. We have public hearings that are scheduled for a couple different items. Item number 20, which is our um, final approval of the city hall financing. And then our additional sewer appropriations, items 23, 24, and 25. Um, the great folks at Barnes and Thornburg were thinking ahead and noticed those uh, public hearings before we adjusted the schedule. So those public hearings are scheduled for seven o'clock. What I'd ask for is that we simply move those agenda items to the at tail end of the agenda so that we can hit that time frame hopefully sounds good thank you and when i get to item 20 and i forget i will, will tell you remind you. me okay thank you. thank you just preparing you know for everything after leaving the finance committee report a flashbang went off i think at city hall and so that that startled me enough where you know it was, thanks thanks for Ed. Ed, appreciate it yeah <laughs> they were using city hall old city hall for training um, so, anyways, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Pete. Second. second. Second by Cecilia. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And I'll, stay, I'll abstain. Okay. Since I was online, but I didn't hear anything, so I don't think I can approve. All right. Moving on to item 8, R091922F. Request to approve a resolution adopting the fiscal plan for home court estates. Yes, so um, I'm going to present these next two items together, but they will need to be voted on separately. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I just I don't know if it's... Tracy is the... Okay. I can hear you very well. Thank you. Great. Uh, so this is for an annexation of home court estates. You saw this last month for the public hearing. This is a property off of 131st Street, um, just near Sand Creek uh, Intermediate School. And so this is for the fiscal plan and then for the final reading. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Pete. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Second by Selena. Open up for any discussion. Anybody have any comments or questions? 
Okay, motion by Pete, second by Selena. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And Todd, aye. Since, aye. since John is aye. participating remotely, we're gonna have to take a roll oh, call vote, right. unfortunately. Okay. So go ahead, uh, Jennifer, you go with roll call, please. Zim Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Aye. Cecilia Coble. Aye. Selena Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Baer. Aye. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. The vote was eight, one absent, passed. All right. Thank you very much. Moving on to item nine, 081522, request to approve a voluntary annexation. Yes, and this is uh, still the same annexation. So the last vote was for the fiscal plan, and then this is for the final reading of motion. the annexation. Thank motion you. to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second by Selena. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Roll call. Oh, roll call. Sorry, roll call. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. John Weingart. That sound means yeah, he's off. Trying to connect. Okay. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Coble? Yes. Selena Stoller? Aye. Jocelyn Vare? Aye. Crystal Newman? Aye. David Giffel? Aye. John Weingart? Okay. We can move on. Yeah, Seven yay. We have, yeah, yeah, we have enough, fine. so we're fine. Thank you. Moving on to item 10, 091922B, request to approve voluntary annexation. Yeah, so I'm gonna present these next two items together as well. So the first is gonna be for the annexation and then the second is um, on the rezone. So this is for a new um, commercial development called Magnolia Grove Salon. The property is currently zoned R2 residential and they are requesting a rezone to C1 commercial. And so here are the renderings of that building. Uh, it is planned to look residential in character just to match um, the other properties in the area. This is a uh, an existing residential property directly off of 116th Street. So here's the location. Um, it's near the Kroger at 116th and Olio. Uh, it's near the Cornerstone Lutheran Church. And so the area identified in red there is their proposed site plan. This will connect to the sidewalk um, that is near the Kroger development and detention area. Um, but as I mentioned, it's currently zoned residential and they are proposing to uh, C1 commercial zoning. And the intended use is a two tenant space. One would be a hair salon, and then the other tenant space would be a dog grooming facility. Both uses are allowed within the C1 district. Okay. So, motion to approve. Have first reading. First reading. And then you have public hearing. Yep. Yep. So, just for clarification, um, the first item related to this matter is the public hearing for the annexation, and then the second is the first reading for the rezone. Oh, so, we need to do public, public hearing. hearing. Okay. Correct. All right, we'll open up for public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak, step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Michael Colby. I live at 7105 Cold Dyke Drive here in Fishers. And, and could I see the rendering again where you had the uh, location of the... Uh... So to the right of that, what is that? Uh, development there is that currently commercial is that residential are we right. squeezing something in between the two, two commercials uh, so no, uh, let me hit the mic the right. i want to clarify that this is the public hearing related to the annexation this will go to plan commission for the rezone public hearing but it is commercial um, on that side of the development okay so that that would this would not be an appropriate question for this particular reading unless it's related to the annexation okay all right then i guess i'll wait thank you thank you mike Anyone else wishing to speak, step forward, state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, close the public hearing. We have first reading. Right. Yep, I gave it first reading. All right. Moving on to item 11, 091922C, request to approve a rezone petition from R2 to C1. So that was the uh, the first reading on that we just held. That was the first. Okay. Yep. So we'll yep. Go. Sorry for the confusion. The it's organized a little bit differently for this meeting. How about item twelve? Is that? 
Yep, item 12. Uh, yes. Move on to item Is that the 12. text amendment to the UDO? Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, so uh, this is again for first reading. This is a text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, this is an update to our sign standards. I know we've brought several of these before you recently, and these are recommendations by our legal counsel. As court cases that get decided on sign requests, um, they recommend that we update our UDO to make sure that we're compliant with all state um, legislation. And so this is really in response to that. We're updating um, some minor changes to our temporary sign standards. Before I call for first reading, is there any, anyone having questions on that item? I just had a question from um, reviewing it and with the X out, um, like the strikes and the UDO text. Um, basically, I understand the changes, those si the signs that are um, being discussed can stay up longer. Is that the essence of the change? Yeah, we're removing the duration requirement. Okay, okay, thanks. I just wanted to be sure I read that correctly. Yep. Okay, anyone else? Have first reading. First reading, thank you. Thank you. All right, then uh, Mayor Fadness would like to speak a few minutes. Thank you, Council President Zimmerman. Uh, before we get going on what is really a historic evening here in the city of Fishers, just a few comments uh, about the $1.1 billion of investment you'll be contemplating or uh, giving consideration to tonight. Uh, we're fortunate to have in the uh, attendance tonight uh, executives from corporate America uh, we have executives from Italy uh, that have flown across the pond to be here tonight to talk to you about um, their investments in our community. And this really is a new chapter, frankly, in the city of Fishers. And so uh, I couldn't be prouder of the decisions and, and the work that's been put into our community to date to put us in this position to be contemplating a billion dollars of economic development while in the same evening providing a, a budget for your consideration that actually cuts our property tax rate yet again this year. So this is, uh, to me, a culmination of a lot of work and, and a lot of uh, hard decisions that took a lot of political courage from the city council. And uh, I'll be forever grateful uh, for you guys as a partner in that. Uh, but I look forward for you to hear from each one of these folks. And I think you'll understand just the quality and character of the individuals that are stepping forward to say they want to be a part of the Fisher story. Uh, and um, these names are well known uh, in many places and I, I look forward for you all to get to know them as well as I have over the last several months. So with that, I'll turn it over to Megan Baumgartner, Director of Economic Development, to walk you through these proposals. Thank you, Mayor. For the record, Megan Baumgartner, Director of Community and Economic Development for the city. Um, so as the mayor mentioned, we have $1.1 billion of LEED certified standards. Um, so this will be a compliment to Ritchie Woods Nature Preserve. They have plans and we're working with them on our Nature First program and ways to integrate their LEED certified facility in with uh, Ritchie Woods. So it is a compliment um, and they're excited to continue to build that out and we'll of course share um, uh, updates with council as that program gets refined. Um, the Andretti Global Headquarters Economic Impact Analysis. Um, so as anyone who's driven out there right now, there's uh, nothing on the site, so there's no existing base value, um, no assessed value at that site. Um, with the real property that is projected for the, and that, so real property again is just the building itself is projected at about $69 million. Taking the, um, the TIF tax rate, which is that 1.9341, uh, um, the annual taxes then that would then be captured by Andretti as part of their TIF project uh, is 1.39 or 1.33 million. Again, after the life of the bond, that's revenue that goes directly back to the city. Um, and then the value to HSC district per year is $245,000 um, based off of count half oval or half circle. That will be the museum, um, and that's the area then on the lower left-hand side that'll be facing towards the Nickel Plate Trail. Just one point of uh, clarification. I saw Councilwoman Bear mouth this, and uh, we yeah, talked yeah. about this at the Finance Committee, so I just wanna be clear. That uh, 245,000 is uh, 2.45 teachers total compensation, not just salary, but benefits and all things included. So we don't want people going around thinking that our teachers are getting paid $125,000 a year. Uh, so just to clarify. Thank you. Um, and then an overview of the incentive package here. Um, so we are requesting approval of a developer purchase TIF bond. 
Um, they would be able to capture 100% of the proceeds of the entire airport development. Um, so the next item after this project agreement is the uh, council approval of being able to issue those bonds. Um, the waiver of impact fees, one thing that we've talked a lot about here um, at council is the impact fees um, and where those go. So I wanna point out on here the, the yellow highlighted areas um, those are the public roads that they will be building as part of their project. Um, the areas in purple are then future development areas that they, as of Friday, entered into um, a, a, an option with the airport to purchase the remainder of that area. So we do anticipate future development and future public infrastructure going on there. Um, and then uh, the city is also um, already under the process of bringing and constructing sewer to this site. So if you'll recall, since the airport development um, conversation started in 2015, utilities and having the ability to bring those out there was a, a real hindrance for us to be able to move anything forward. Um, so now I'd love to be able to bring up uh, Marissa Andretti and uh, Larry Gigrich with Genovis to share a little bit from their perspective of the project and a little bit about the Andretti family. Can we second. hold up yeah, oh. one second? Oh. We're having a technical issue. Apologies. Take this moment to tell you guys how thrilled our IT director was when we uh, moved out of City Hall and have meetings in 17 different locations. He, he did, he, absolutely. This guy is the hardest working guy in the building. We have, uh, so, so you know, there is audio. We're still streaming. We've just lost the video. So. Okay. Well, I, I think with audio, we yeah, can keep moving forward. I'll get us back. Marissa, you're just going to have to be very descriptive. <laughs> okay. Let's go over words. <laughs> Hello, my name is Marissa Andretti with Andretti Auto Sport. Um, very excited to be here, so thank you all for your time and many thanks to Megan and Mayor Fadness for your help throughout this entire process and just the collaboration in general. We're, we're very proud to be here. Um, let me go ahead and hop to the next. So I know Megan touched a bit, um, but so Andretti Auto Sport, uh, we are currently in seven different racing series globally and we are forever looking to diversify and we are just very excited to be able to bring our global headquarters to Fishers, Indiana and truly make it a, a campus feel and a true community to be able to, to host our, our employees and other members of the community as well as our fans and um, you know all, all of our friends and family and, and sponsors and so forth. Um, we're really truly trying to um, you know, create that atmosphere for, you know, along the nickel plate trail for the walking paths and a top of the line fitness facility and all the top amenities and things of that effect to, to truly have that draw. And we're just, we're excited and, and proud to be a part of it. Um, so, you know, in all of that, obviously to attract top talent and uh, truly make it a destination environment. And we plan to also have um, a various restaurants essentially within our, our campus area and things of that nature. Um, I know we touched a bit on the museum and I will show that again here. So this main photo, which sorry for those who can't see, um, what we shared with our press release a few weeks ago is is this main photo and that is of our museum. And we're, we're really excited to be able to open that up to the public and be able to host events in the surrounding area. So as you'll see the, you know, the handful of people outside there, that would be an area for our restaurant location. Um, and then as we get to the grander site um, of the, the conceptual site plan that you guys have already seen, that square or rectangle, rectangle rather um, area is all, all of our race shop and, and office area. So we're, we're very excited and, and proud to be here and appreciate um, everyone's time and consideration throughout this project. And we're just, we're happy to be here. Thank so you thank very you. much. Yeah, appreciate thank you. It. Oh, it's not as zoomed in as it will be in a minute. Oh, good. 
Um, well, the video is lined back up. Um, again, there are two items related to this project. Um, the first is the project agreement, um, and then the second would be for the ordinance related to the issuance of the bonds. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about uh, the project. Lisa can answer any questions about the ordinance to, to start issuing the bonds. And again, that's the first in a very long process um, related to this project. Um, and again, Marissa, I'm sure, would be happy to answer questions as well. All right, before we have questions or comments, I just want to clarify. So, Chris, item 13, we will vote on today, correct? That's correct. And then item 14 is just a first reading. That's correct. And public hearing on either one of these? No. Right. no so, on item 13. I'm going to yeah. make a motion to approve because that's what you're going to ask next. Because motion by Pete. Second. Second by Selena. We'll open it up for discussion. Comments, questions? So I just have a quick comment. So my only ask, again, because it's near Ritchie Woods, I've gotten a lot of emails about the environmental piece. So just making sure that like the environmental aspect is really taken care of and the ecosystems around there are just pretty much left alone, I suppose. So. Absolutely. No, that's, that's first and foremost in our mind. And sorry for not mentioning that earlier, but just echo Councillor Newman's uh, comment. The comments that I've received from citizens is great enthusiasm and intrigue. So thank you very much. This is, um, I think for many of us, just something really exciting that we um, possibly never saw Fishers partnering with a, a firm like yours and it's very exciting. Um, but the number one concern that I have on top of that enthusiasm is about the environmental impact. I think um, most will feel like the location um, next to the beloved Ritchie Woods is a very special place. And frankly, when I think the um, announcement first came out, a motorsport company next to Ritchie <laughs> Woods, there, can you help connect um, sure. how we can, I would say two things if you don't mind, very quickly. Explain what LEED standards are, that's important and how just moving forward we will be able to ensure that Richie Woods is protected and kept healthy with a good neighbor. Please. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me hop in front of the mic, sorry. Um, so from our perspective, we plan to keep it top of mind for the whole planning process and design of our building from an efficiency perspective to all of the environmental factors as well. Um, for some background, for our current building, it's, I mean, it's like mid 90s and uh, we are working at the moment to become ISO 14001 certified um, of which we are essentially replicating what we've been able to achieve out of our headquarters or smaller headquarters for our Formula E program in the UK um, of which we were able to get the ISO 14001 certification and because we did such a heavy due diligence on that front we, we were then able to go ahead and apply for the FIA accreditability accreditation from a sustainability perspective and it has like one star two star and three star is the most elite and we were able to actually fast track to this two star and we were just arms rank arms length of the three star and we achieved that just I think earlier this year it was and we, we shared that news and we're really excited so what we're doing is we're gonna make sure to implement all of the same practices here in the US because here what we do across all of our racing programs is essentially take all of the best key learnings and you know, apply that to our diverse portfolio. So that's definitely something top of mind and specifically near and dear to my heart, quite honestly. <laughs> um, so I was very excited about being next to uh, Richie Woods and be able to collaborate with Megan and things like that too on the, the programs that are already in place and hopefully be able to help support in a, a bigger way too. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, from the designation of the nature preserve, it has specific boundaries and they are um, none of that land. I think it's probably a 60 foot separation between the edge of the actual designation of the nature preserve to then the property boundary of um, Andretti. So there's a significant difference. Um, but again, through our TAC process, the federal, um, the FAA approval process, 
um, we're going to make sure that this property is not going to, again, negatively impact it. Um, so, I mean, we can try, is there another type of, go ahead. I think we're, we've got a great project that's sensitive and interested in Ritchie Woods and holding Ritchie Woods up as an example. So there in itself, you have a partner. And then if we recall, um, it was a couple of years ago, the city actually entered into a contract with the airport to expand Ritchie Woods. We bought an additional 17 acres of what we felt was really environmentally uh, substantive property to further buffer. So um, I think you'll see as time progresses, both in form, but also in program, that this will actually become a value partner uh, moving forward. And Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe Jason, I know when we do road projects, you know, there's always an environmental impact report that's done that's a state requirement, right? And I would think that you know, whenever you're touching it or coming close to any wetlands or anything else, there's a requirement yeah, that, for an all environmental the, report to all be the done by the civil yeah. engineers. All the appropriate uh, permitting will be done, but I think to, to Councilwoman Bear's general question, um, I think we've, we've actually found a client to locate here that is doing expressly for the purpose of being next to the environment and holding up best practices. And so I think both in the form of what they're building and in the programs in which they're gonna host, I think it's gonna be extraordinary. I can't imagine our kids now being able to go to Ritchie Woods and on the same day go visit Andretti uh, Global uh, Sports and learn about environmental education there. I mean, that is just an unbelievable opportunity. So I, I think there's gonna be more creativity that comes out of this partnership than we even can fathom uh, sitting here today. And one final thing, we had kind of joked about it before, they're not gonna be doing any testing or racing on the property. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask, right? Like, just when you, when you think about the, yes. the, the, the how right. corporation you are and the nature preserves, some of these questions came up. Right. These are good right. questions. Yeah, I don't think there's a road course yeah. planned. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. absolutely. Or down 96th Street, but I don't think our officers <laughs> Question on that. No. Yeah, no testing. Thank you. I can't test my down the <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Josh, I, I'm going to make sure he has an updated input for Josh. All right. So this is R091922. Todd Zimmerman. Yes. John Weingart. Cecilia Koval. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Crystal Newman. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Selena Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vare. Aye. John Weingart. Good. Motion Thank passes. Oh, is he? Okay. Muted. Is that like a half vote? Is that I, I don't know. You'll have to check with Chris on that one. Yeah. All right. Uh, approved. Okay. Moving on to uh, 091922E. Uh, first reading. I'll give it a first reading. First reading. We want to. All right. First reading. I think we're supposed to everybody. Yeah. 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 We're, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. And just for the Andretti team, you don't have to stay for the whole meeting if you don't <laughs> like to. So thank you all for being here tonight. It's thank great. You yeah, but if, if you don't, I was going to kind of wait for comments. Okay, congratulations and thank yeah. you. Thank you. Really, thank honestly, you. I think it's a tremendous deal. Appreciate you all. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to item 15, R091922H. Is that? Thank you. Uh, Tracy, this is an. This is what we want to close or what we want to open? Uh, that's the presentation that I still need open. You still need open? Yep. That's just, it's not the slide that's up there. Got it. Of course. That's fun. Where is it physically?
uh, total investment now $309 million. Um, they are also increasing their job commitments to 515 employees. Um, before it was 215 um, by 2020, or 2031 with an average salary of $70,000. Um, this is an aerial from last week. Um, so if you've driven out by the site, they are moving out there. Um, and this is a pretty incredible site. Um, and it's been really exciting to see all the progress that they've made. Um, again, the economic impact analysis, the, as you'll see on the next slide, we're requesting a 20-year, 80% um, capture of a personal property tax abatement. Um, so the existing assessed value is $0. This assessed value new reflects the real property and personal property for the project, which is $345 million. Um, annual taxes, this amount does account for the abatement value. Um, so with 80% over 20 years, um, they're phasing in their personal property purchases. So this accounts for a couple of different changes throughout uh, the period of the abatement. Um, and again, the value to the HSC school district per year of $211,000. Um, and again, equivalent to 2.1 uh, full-time full benefits of teachers. Did I, did I explain that okay this time? Uh, the seven auto group expansion uh, incentives. So on the site plan on the screen, um, you'll see the red outline is the road infrastructure that they're bringing onto and building into the site. Um, and then the yellow area is where they are bringing their sanitary sewer onto the site. Um, so they're bringing a lot of infrastructure for some very large users into this area. Um, and as a reflection of that, uh, we're requesting a waiver of their permitting and impact fees. Um, then we're also requesting um, approval of the master detention construction for the entire life science and innovation park. So this allows us to provide uh, master detention for list bio and then maximizes our remaining eight and a half acres for um, an actual building to go on there instead of having to utilize some of that space for master detention. Um, and tonight, as the mayor mentioned, we have a few members of Seven Auto who are here, um, and I would love to invite them up to share a little bit about themselves with you and about this expansion of the project. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Scott Ham. I am the project manager uh, for this uh, facility that you saw a picture of. Uh, I've been with Steven Otto for four to five months, so I'm relatively new, uh, but I'm also a Fishers resident, so I'm really excited about what we're doing in the community and, and everything that we're bringing to the table, um, all the things that, that Megan mentioned. Um, so I'm excited, but on behalf of Steven Otto Group, we are grateful for Megan, uh, Mayor Fadness, all that you guys have done for us. Uh, it's been an incredible. Uh, at least in my short time, it's been a great experience. So we're really appreciative of that. Um, fortunately tonight, I have four of my colleagues from Italy here, which is great. And uh, this is William Spanchiato, and I'm gonna allow him to say a few words. Yes, thanks. I'm really proud to be here in front of you, representing Stevanato Group. Uh, Stevanato Group is a global provider for a pharmaceutical company and biotechnology company. And uh, we, we, we believe that uh, Indianapolis and Fishers could be really a key successor factor for, for our business. Um, we, we had the opportunity last uh, October to host uh, Mayor Scott, uh, Mayor Fadness and, uh, and Megan in, uh, in our facility to show our processes and our uh, capabilities. And due to the favorable, favorable market condition and the support that we are receiving since last year from Megan and from uh, her team, uh, we decided to enlarge the, the scope of, uh, of the project uh, till the 500 uh, million, around 500 million, and in order to uh, create uh, five, mo over 500 new jobs in, uh, in Fishers. So thanks, first of all, to, to Kathy and uh, and Alexis and KSM that introduce us to the to to, to Fisher, and uh, I, I remember every time that I met uh, Megan. I remember the first time that I joined uh, the first meeting with uh, with Megan and her and her team, 
it was really a tough, a tough period for, for the project, but thanks to her support, and uh, we, we overpassed the, the, the roadblocks that we, that we met till, uh, till now. So thanks again. And Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions regarding this project. Um, again, this is a first amendment to the existing project agreement with 7 Auto. So I have a motion, motion to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second by Cecilia. Open up for questions or comments. John? Again, the only comment I'll make, and I'll, and I'll say this now, and I'll probably say it again, and, and Scott, Megan, the entire team here at Fishers, you guys make it a joy to be a council person, honest to God. I mean, I travel around the state and, and I'm seeing what other communities are doing and the communities are immensely jealous of our community because we don't lay down. We continue to move forward. And, and I can't tell you how proud I am to tell everybody that I'm from here and, and thank you for all that you have done, Stefan Auto Group, coming from Italy, looking at Little Fishers, Indiana, and going, where are you taking me? <laughs> right, and you end up here, that's terrific. I can't be more thankful for you guys. I wish you the best of luck. And uh, I think it's a, a dynamite project. I just drove by it on my way in today to the meeting and I saw everything happening, which is great. So again, again great job, Scott and team. It was fantastic. <laughs> is there any way, I mean, this is our life sciences area that we can better signify to the community as to what these buildings are, where this life sciences uh, district is going to be. Um, I, I just think that really identifying it and highlighting it as a highlight of our community because it is a magnificent feature that we have and a great investment. Yeah, I think that we absolutely can. We have a couple of smaller um, signs that we put up of the Fisher's Life Science and Innovation Park. Um, but I think I agree with you. We can absolutely make that more pronounced and, and share that news. Um, and we're also going to be rolling out a marketing campaign specifically for that um, park and the remaining eight acres. So um, I love that idea. And we will start to work on that. I told her we couldn't put any signage up until she hit 700 million. So, <laughs> and, uh, I always exceed expectations. Any other questions or comments? May and I add a question. The jobs, what is the timeline for the 500, the rollout of the 500? So they jobs? have until 2031. Um, there's a pretty steady drumbeat to start with to get them to 200. And then through those remaining years, um, it's smaller chunks. Um, but they're. Uh, but we are giving them that full time period to, to reach up to their full ramp up of 515. Sure, sure. Again, you excellent job by your economic development team. I, I'm excited uh, just today having Andretti and the, uh, this group from Italy, um, Stefanato, I mean, wow, <laughs> Italy from, <laughs> to come here to Fishers again, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, it will provide a lot of great opportunities for our community and be the catalyst to the life science industry here in Fishers, Indiana. So great, great job, and uh, I'm really excited. And most importantly, I hope you get a chance to uh, taste a Indiana tenderloin before you leave, because <laughs> that's what we're known for. So thanks. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. <laughs> He's muted. That was a yes. <laughs> One for yes, two for no. <laughs> Pete Peterson. <laughs> yes. Cecilia Coble. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. 
Selena Stoller? Aye. Jocelyn Vare? Aye. Crystal Newman? Aye. David Giffel? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You do not have to stay. <laughs> All right, uh, final economic development project for the evening is the final and next phase, rather, of Fisher's District. Um, so this map does a really good job of showing you kind of where we've come, um, where we started at the yard at Fisher's District, expanded that to the market Fisher's District, the stations at Fisher's District, and now we're moving south. Um, the slate at Fisher's District, which is a project that council had approved a, a, um, about a year ago, um, that's under construction and doing incredibly well. Um, and so we are excited tonight to bring forward this full expansion, the full development um, and of this transformational project. Um, so with this new development tonight, uh, we have the Commons and the Event Center, which is the area in orange. Um, and included in that is an event center, which will have 8,500 seat capacity. Um, between the union and the event center, approximately 60,000 square feet of retail, two hotels, um, and something that we're very excited about is 70,000 square feet of additional and new office space. Um, we constantly have heard requests for office near Fisher's district since it has so many amenities nearby, it's such a walkable environment, and so we're excited now um, to bring forward 70,000 square feet of additional office space. And again, the total amount here is $550 million which now between the other previous versions of the yard or of Fisher's district um, brings that total investment area to close to $800 million. Um, so this is an, an overall aerial site plan. Um, the union again is up here on the north. Um, Thompson Thrift is here and they'll talk a little bit about the different areas that are included in, in these two separate developments. Um, but really wanted to show this and highlight a couple of the things that we're excited about and we're very diligent about um, during our discussions with Thompson Thrift. Um, the area in yellow, that dotted line, um, if you've gone down USA Parkway or uh, have spoken with a Forum Credit Union employee, you will know that right now there is no way to get from Forum or from Navient all the way north up to Fisher's District. Um, and so we're excited to be able to provide that true pedestrian connectivity along USA Parkway but then also working with Thompson Thrift to create connected trails and paths through the slate, the union, and Fisher's District, all the way, or Fisher's Event Center, all the way up to uh, the existing Fisher's District. Um, so again, the, the real highlight in the commons is the event center, which is a $170 million uh, multi-use event center. Um, we're excited tonight to again have Thompson Thrift here, but then also the operator of that facility, Jim Hallett, is here to share a little bit of um, information about what you can expect out of this facility. Um, some of these are the renderings, and again, very similar to what we worked on at the yard at Fisher's District in the Mark, um, is all the green space and areas for the community to get out and enjoy those spaces and not just the restaurants and the, um, the facilities and amenities inside. Here are a couple of the interior renderings of Fisher's District, and again, um, we'll talk a bit in a um, or talk about it in a bit. But this facility will be able to host concerts, uh, community events, graduations, um, and hockey, uh, and in addition to other uh, sporting events. And what I think both of these pictures do a really good job highlighting is the way that this facility will be um, activated to provide multiple different opportunities and experiences within here. Um, so it isn't all going to be individual seats. There will be high top bars that you can stand and enjoy a concert with your family. Um, there will be certain lounges throughout the facility. So it truly, you could have a very different experience every time you go to an event at this facility. Um, so lots of different groups came together to put this incredible and transformational project um, into place. Um, this screen and this slide shows the different groups who and partners included in this. Uh, so Thompson Thrift is the master developer. Again, they were um, our partner from the beginning at Fisher's District with the yard. Um, architectural firms, uh, uh, Brisbane, Brook, and Bainan, uh, they, are, um, they are world renowned for their uh, architects of architecture for event centers. So they did Madison Square Garden, 
um, and have really elevated uh, this facility to be a world-class um, event center. Um, OVG has come along to help advise the city um, as we look at the financial fe feasibility and came to this structure. Um, operations, again, Hallett Sports and Entertainment, and then the construction manager is Acom Hunt. Um, and they have, again, a, very similar to our architectural partner, um, a long history and a lot of experience working on these sort of facilities. Uh, for this next phase of Fisher's District, um, the total assessed value projected, um, and again, this is only for the union, the commons, and the event center, is $130 million. Um, annual taxes here are projected to be uh, over $2.5 million for the value, again, to the schools as over $460,000 per year. Um, and one thing, I, and Thompson Thrift will have some larger pictures here as well, um, but this aerial is if you are on the south side of the development looking to the north um, with the event center here. And really, I think what's incredible is that the architects and our team have worked to make sure that this doesn't look like a behemoth of a Lucas oil that then is not something that's integrated into a community. Um, and so we're really excited about how this has turned out. And this really is a true representation of what this uh, space will look like. Um, so now I'd love to have uh, Thompson Thrift come up, share a little bit about their overall vision, um, how they've come to partner with us and their, uh, again, how they plan to execute on all this. So I'll turn it over. As uh, Thompson Thrift walks up, Council President Zimmerman, I think it's just important to frame this a little bit different than the last two items. The last two, we were seeking a final vote on an economic development agreement. Uh, tonight, this is an introduction of a project. And so we're not, we're not asking for any final votes from anyone here tonight. We're really introducing the project to the council and really the community at large in more depth. So slightly different than the last two uh, agenda items. Uh, just to, before we start, can you folks hear me now? Great, thank you. <laughs> Great, All right. thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Ryan Menard. I'm Vice President of Development with Thompson Thrift, and I appreciate the opportunity to come up tonight and talk through the vision. It's a lot of uh, hours of work with both Mayor Fred, Mayor Megan, and just the entire staff of the city, really trying to pull these projects together. Um, as you can see on this aerial, I think Megan shared earlier, Really what we're trying to do here is a master development of these projects. It's vision to strengthen an area that's really become a regional draw in Fishers. So these intentional integrated developments all feature, are all going to feature central green spaces around which the community can gather. And it's going to promote connectivity and walkability and will further support the existing businesses in this area. And it's also going to provide an amenity for the community that's going to be truly unique. So as we saw with Fisher's District and the adjacent station, it really proved that this community wanted developments that were experiential as well as providing a service. And the success of the developments and the tenants within really is in large part due to a strong unified vision by both the city and Thompson Thrift. So as we get to the union, we really see the ability to continue that vision and the dynamic feel of the yard in a vertically integrated environment. The union will be focused around the public gathering space that will be further activated by restaurants, entertainment concepts, and retail. And then there will be a mixed-use building with 250 apartment units, a hotel, and an office component, as Megan mentioned, that will add daytime population as well. Here is a rendering, if you look from the north, from the district, down south through the union. So you can see that, again, what we're striving for here is just vehicular and pedestrian connectivity through these developments that make them really feel and function as one development and that will be a space that further creates more of a, a live, work, and play where you really don't have to hop in your car. You can kind of do everything you want right here. So the slate, which is the next development, which was previously announced, is going to provide, uh, or, sorry, it'll be comprised of about 242 upscale townhomes and villas, and it's going to provide kind of the backbone for this expansion. There will be a series of connected walking paths throughout the development that will give people the ability to move from the yard, the union, down all the way to uh, uh, the event center in the commons. And as Megan mentioned as well, we will be putting a walking path along USA Parkway to provide yet another opportunity for again, people to be able to walk to and from all of these developments. The event center itself will provide the anchor for this phase of the expansion and will connect 116th Street really down to 106th Street. The development of this facility will bring people and events to the city, increasing its regional profile and making it a true destination for folks in the Midwest. 
The event center will have, sit on a large public area and we foresee that being able to host events like pregame activities or other public events like farmers markets. And with that, there'll be additional developments that'll fill in around the event center as we see throughout the country with the potential for us to potentially create another main street where you have more mixed use uh, buildings there with residential, potential for additional entertainment, office, hotel, and certainly more restaurants and retail. So again, we see this as an opportunity to really maximize the impact that these developments can have on the community and fishers. And if we continue to be intentional in our design and mm -hmm. strategic in the way that we approach these and by having one vision that we share with the city. So, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Last one. Perfect. Um, so again, this is another uh, aerial rendering of what these facilities, these buildings will actually look like um, and then their proximity to all of the different developments um, in, in neighborhoods. Um, next, we would like to have Jim Hallett and Larry Gigridge come up and share a little bit about their role as our partners in operating this facility. Um, and so I'll turn it over to both of you. Great, thank you, Megan. And good evening, I wanna take the opportunity to thank Mayor Fadness and certainly all the entire city council for allowing us the opportunity to present here this evening. Hal Sports and Entertainment and the Indy Fuel are extremely appreciative of the great collaboration that's taken place with Mayor Fadness and with his team and with the council members to date. Mayor Fadness and I began a discussion a long time ago. <laughs> um, and we really talked about the opportunity to try to create a partnership that would result in a transformative project for the city of Fishers. And with that, we're very excited that we're right on the doorstep now of being able to implement that shared vision that we've been talking about for a number of years uh, in terms of uh, being able to create this event center in our community. And with that, I would say that uh, this has been a, a uh, process that uh, uh, began with a world-class team that Megan talked about, and I'm not gonna repeat everything that Megan talked about, but it's pretty easy to throw around the term world-class. Everybody likes to use that expression. But I can tell you, this team that Megan presented to you, of Thompson and Thrift, the architects that are involved, I call them BBB for short, Bain, Brisbane, Brooks, um, <coughs> and um, the Oakview Group, and of course Hunt, and with Thompson and Thrift and Hunt being located right here in the greater Indianapolis market, uh, this is really and truly a world world, world-class team. And I can tell you that when I'm together with this team and when I'm meeting with this team, it actually gives me goosebumps to be sitting in the same room with so much talented people that I've had the opportunity to work with over the last several years. So with that, um, well, I'll say no more about the team other than they're great and they're wonderful to work with. We've prepared a brief presentation here this evening that we're gonna share with you regarding the vision of the project and the parties that are involved in Joining me is no stranger and Larry Gigerich. Uh, as many of you may know, Larry is the executive managing director of Genovis, which is a well-known firm based here in Fishers. Um, and Larry has worked side by side with myself, uh, along with Mayor Fadness and Mayor Fadness's team uh, from the very, very beginning of this project. Um, and Larry and I are gonna tag team the uh, presentation here this evening. Um, we have a few slides for you and um, I'll turn it over to Larry and Larry takes away and I'll uh, finish up here in a few moments. Thank you. Great, well, it, it's good to be with all of you again and thank you for the opportunity and thanks for the support, Mayor Fadness, the entire team, Megan, and the opportunity to spend time with counselors along the way as well. Jim being the humble servant leader that he is, asked me to cover a couple of slides, including his background, for those of you who may not fully know, know Jim, so Jim is currently the chairman of Car Global, a Fortune 1000 company that's based here in the Indianapolis area. He owns the Indy Fuel, which is the professional minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks in the ECHL. Uh, he was recognized for a number of things. I just picked a few here that I thought were interesting. Uh, he was the 2019 National Auto Auction Association Hall of Fame Award recipient, the 2018 Indiana Chamber of Commerce Dynamic Leader of the Year, the 2017 United Way of Central Indiana Exceptional Executive, and the 2014 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. And I, I would highlight just briefly the United Way recognition. 
Jim does so much from a charitable perspective in central Indiana that nobody knows about. He doesn't go out looking for attention when he does it, but lots and lots of things that he has supported over the years very, very quietly in the community. And then just uh, quickly, Hallett Sports and Entertainment, it's an entity that's owned by Jim and his family. Uh, they have a full-time staff that will be dedicated to professionally managing the facility for the city of Fishers. Oakview Group, who Megan and Jim both mentioned, will partner with Hallett Sports Entertainment and the city of Fishers to help ensure a successful launch of the facility. The operating model, which I know is important to the mayor and his team and all of you, uh, ensures the city of Fishers is not in the business of running a non-core business. It's part of a city and what you guys do for all of your constituents. And then uh, lastly, just would point to a couple major investments Jim has made. So uh, I think all of you are aware of the fuel tank that's here, the training facility for the fuel, uh, but also provides other community access and benefits to an ice sports facility. And Jim also built an apartment complex adjacent to the fuel tank for his players. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out one very special thing that I think really gets to the heart of who Jim is. So Jim has a couple players on his team that he kept here so they would not have to go back to Russia and fight in the war. He asked the commissioner of the league to grant a special exception to do that. And I think that just really speaks to the kind of man Jim is. Um, and the last thing I'd point to, Jim also uh, purchased a warehouse here in the community uh, that he utilizes for different operations as well. So he's already invested in the community and this will be a much bigger statement. So Jim, Jim has just a couple things he's gonna touch on here and then we will wrap up. Thank you, Larry, that was very gracious. Um, so just a couple things I guess I can share with you and uh, we'll answer some questions here at the end if uh, you wish. Uh, but the ECHL awarded a franchise to uh, myself in uh, 2013 and it wasn't an existing franchise it was a brand new startup franchise um, and with that the fuel began play in the coliseum in 2014 2015 so we're going to be entering our ninth season i had to think about that for a second we're going to be entering our ninth season here on the 21st of october the season starts now uh, larry mentioned that the fuel is the minor league affiliate of the chicago blackhawks uh, a franchise that's uh, one of the original six and one that we're very proud to be affiliated with and uh, they uh, have uh, been the recipients of three Stanley Cups here in the past 10 years so it's been an exciting franchise to be around and I think the community when you think of the proximity of, Indi of Indianapolis and Fishers and the communities here um, m most of those hockey fans um, kind of anoint the Blackhawks as their team sort of thing, the closest team in the area. Um, with that, um, I will tell you that uh, in nine years, we've been a very, very successful franchise. And I say that in the most humble means. Um, the fuel has been recognized uh, not only for the product that we put on the ice, but also for the fan experience, the family experience. We're all about affordable family fun entertainment. And um, we've won a number of reward, uh, reward awards for that and uh, are highly regarded for that. Thank you, Larry. Um, you know, there's a multitude of things and I could never go through them all. So this is uh, not an exhaustive list, but it's a representative list of activities that could take place here. When I sat with the architects and as we said, they build these <laughs> arenas all over the world. Um, you know, I said, let's try to make up a quick list here of events that we could host here. And in less than 10 or 15 minutes, the architect sat with me and we came up with a list of 53 events, you'll recall. Um, and so there's a, obviously a lot of sports, you know, and not just hockey. This is not a hockey arena, this is an event center. And we're gonna host events and as many events as we can possibly host uh, to, for, for our, our, our uh, locals to enjoy. Um, so you got all the sporting events, um, you have the music and the entertainment events, all the concerts, things of that nature, uh, and then you have um, community events, could be conventions. Um, uh, one thing I think that uh, really uh, resonated was uh, we're going to have the opportunity for our high school graduates to have their own graduation right here in the city of Fishers, and I know that's a big deal uh, for the parents and for the community itself just to know that 
we're recognizing our students in their own community. So with that, um, there's a lo lot of events to take place. Um, we have a schedule of events. Uh, OVG that we've mentioned a number of times helps align some of these events and coordinate some of these events and bring them. And our goal is not to, not to bring outdated talent to Fishers. We're an innovative, vibrant, growing city. Uh, and we want to demonstrate that we're bringing innovative top talent as much as we can to the city. So with that, I'll pause. And uh, if you do have any questions uh, for Larry or for myself, we'd be ha happy to take them now or later, whatever you like. Um, yeah, let's do, why don't we have feedback just from the council and questions and then walk through the items that we need to get into. Go ahead. Uh, how'd you come up with the name Fuel? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, that's interesting. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I, the very first employee I hired was um, a gentleman that worked for me. His wife was in marketing. And we were banging our brains out, trying to think of what are we going to call this team. You know, if you go back to the very start of hockey here in the Indianapolis area, it was 1938. It was mm -hmm. called the Capitals, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, did we want to go back? Wayne Gretzky played here. It was the Racers. Did we want to go back, right? And I'll cut to the chase is Lisa phoned me on a Sunday afternoon and she said, Jerry and I are sitting here having breakfast. We just came from church and I thought of a name for the team. She said, the Indy Fuel. And I said, say it again, Indy Fuel. I said, spell it. <laughs> F-U-E-L, <laughs> right? I said, we're done. And that was the net way. And you know, I could tell you there are teams that, play, that pay hundreds of thousands of dollars doing research to name their team. I, na I named this team for the cost of breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you asked. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? No, just quickly, and you know, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. And, and Jim and I have become friends over the years, and this has been going on a long time. I mean, John and I had conversations with a predecessor who wanted to put an event center up here too and also hockey so I've been talking this concept since my first year on council you know Jim and I got together with our love and affinity for hockey and understanding that if we did something here it needed to be much more than that and in and, and Jim's credit and his visionary experience he knew that from the very get-go and I can't speak more to this man and his character to know that what we will receive in the end will be far beyond our wildest expectations. I, I, I took the previous ownership of the, the rink and walked them down to Jim and his son, trying to sell them this rink to come up here because they needed to put butts in seats, right, to, for your fuel games. And, and, and Jim and his son latched onto that. And the transformation that happened at that fuel tank now, for those of us who have kids playing hockey or going over there for anything, it was incredible the change that went on in that rink because it was tired and it was dingy and everything that went along with it. But uh, people come from Chicago area and the Michigan area to look at that rink by itself and they're like, this is in Fishers, Indiana. And that's a full credit to Jim and his team and everybody else there. So uh, Jim, I couldn't be more thrilled as you know. And, and you know, even though our team isn't the Blackhawks when we talk about our teams playing against each other, <laughs> okay? And I won't disclose who that is. We'll just have that as a side little deal. But I couldn't be more thrilled for the community, for, for Jim and his group, and I can't wait to show up at the game, so. Yeah, you know, one thing I would extend to council is if you haven't visited the fuel tank, I'd offer you the opportunity to come and visit. I'd be happy to give you a tour. Um, when we got here, there were uh, about 400 families that were playing hockey in this area, and today there's over 2,000 families right. that are playing hockey in this area. And listen, hockey is for everyone. Uh, we Hallelujah. have a great girls program that we've started mm -hmm. and it's really taken off. We have a lot of young ladies playing hockey uh, and a, a learn to skate program that is beyond their wildest dreams. Can't imagine how many kids are just coming out to the learn to, to the learn to skate programs there. So it's, it's really been a phenomenal success and I'll only share it because Pete mentioned it is I bought the facility for $1.8 million and we spent over $6 million on it. Yeah. So we got probably eight and a half million dollars in that facility now. So we spent more on it than we paid for the entire building and land, <laughs> All right? So, but thank you. Any other questions or comments? Todd, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Yeah, I just, yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, first of all, you know, Jim, just, you know, your, your passion about hockey and your passion about our community is just exceptional. You know, Pete's right. We've been talking back and forth for probably a decade about this opportunity. I'm just so excited to see something finally become a reality. And the team you put together with Thompson Thrift, they're, they've done an unremarkable job with the marketplace of fishers, plus the hunt group. The hunt group is, uh, many folks don't know, this This company has a tremendous history in the city of Indianapolis. Um, you know, when I was at Ernst & Young uh, many years ago as a staff person, I had the privilege, and you had to be, it was a privilege to work on uh, the Hunt Corp audit and the Hunt Corp tax return. Got to meet some of the the original executives of that of that com company. So uh, it's a great team you've put together. It's a great venue, and just you know, you know having seeing children that our kids are going to be able to use that facility for high school graduations. Um, I'm just really exciting. So congratulations to you, and really appreciate your support of our community. Well, thank you, John. We appreciate you. much of the year will be dedicated to ice and when does the ice come down like can you share with, I mean we've talked about graduation which I think we all really appreciate and are excited to have that facility to be used for our graduates our local graduates but in terms of availability of the facility for other non-fuel events can you help me quantify that a little sure. bit so I get a better picture yeah no fair fair question um, the the majority of events will not be ice events, okay? Uh, but uh, in terms of the fuel, the fuel will play 36 home games, and they could get into the playoffs, which could take them into maybe, if we went all the way, it could take us into maybe 45 games. Um, and um, in terms of availability, and again, there's lots to be worked out as we go forward with the programs and, and the schedule and whatnot, but I don't really see keeping ice there uh, 12 months of the year, we will keep ice at the fuel tank 12 months of the year. Mm -hmm. And the kids can still practice and they can still learn to skate throughout the summer. And we do have some summer programs that do take place, so I would think that it would be um, much more efficient to have that take place at the fuel tank and, and just completely take the ice down uh, at the end of the, at the end of the, what and, I call the season. And I won't um, hold you to all the finer points of it, but again, I just appreciate having a better vision Mm -hmm. of the facility's intended use. Once there's ice up for the fuel when the season starts, which is, as you said, October, right? Um, that ice doesn't come down uh, during the season, right? It stays up it through. Down, but it can go the design of this facility, if we wanted to have a concert on a Saturday night, they would have a, a floor that goes over the ice okay. that would allow. So okay. That's I think the beautiful. last, the Oakview Group, which Mr. Hallett mentioned a number of times as a third party, they're a global manager of facilities. Their pro forma shows 130 to 140 events in the first year and only uh, 35 of those being hockey related. Okay, that's so, that, yeah, that's so helpful. there's, a, there's yeah. a tremendous amount of YouTube video on changing ice over yeah. to a game, to a basketball game in the evening, to a concert. I mean, it's crazy to watch on YouTube. It was uh, all around the country. They do. That. It was yeah. very clear from day one when Jim and I were uh, talking about this that neither one of us have an interest in building uh, an exclusive ice right. facility. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's, you know, uh, value add to the community to only do a facility that caters just to hockey. So, really, I think Jim and I get as excited, if not more excited, about the other things mm -hmm. that we'll be able to do beyond. Hockey, it's fantastic that we'll have an anchor tenant that's gonna be bringing people in there, that's wonderful. But I think the, the rest of the time is what's really pretty exciting. Thank you, that's helpful yeah. for me too. Okay, thank you. I just have one quick comment. Please. Um, somebody asked me this morning, are you a hockey fan? And I said, I am now. <laughs> Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna do a good job, and uh, we're gonna make you proud. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know that we talked a lot about the um, 
the Hallett Sports and Entertainment Group, um, but really the item for tonight for discussion and for a first reading is the, um, the yard phase two PUD is what it's labeled. Um, and that is the PUD for the commons and the event center. Um, so Megan Vukasich will come up um, and share a bit about that um, as part of our next piece of this project. And as, as Megan walks up, I'll just share some context on this PUD. I wanna thank actually the Thompson Thrift Team. Um, we spent countless hours trying to figure out how we could put this site plan together that would actually complement and be sensitive to the area around it. And I think you'll see tonight in the PUD that there was some really thoughtful work that went into that that allows us to fit within the context of the community that we have around there. So, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many Friday phone calls we had about this, but I, I think we've landed on something that's should be very workable for the community. Megan? So we'll move on to item 17. It's 091922F, the yard phase two PUD. Yes, and for the timeline for this uh, rezone, just tonight will be first reading, and then we will hold a public hearing um, the first Wednesday of October. It'll be in this room, so if there is public comment, um, that would be the time for that, and then this will be back before you all for final reading next month. Um, so we went over the specifics of the development. So the zoning, uh, this is really just to codify the development standards for the development itself. We're really looking at this as an expansion of the existing yard at Fishers District. So many of the standards um, in this PUD were taken from that existing PUD itself. I just wanna highlight a few standards specific to this development though. So the first, and it's been mentioned several times tonight, is the pedestrian connections that will be um, weaved throughout the interior of this development and then also along USA Parkway. So the red lines there show all of the pedestrian connections. When the Slate at Fishers District went through for their PUD, they actually dedicated um, trail to the city for public use. And so there is an existing public trail through the Slate at Fishers District that will connect to this new commons and union um, portion of the development. And then in addition, just to provide a direct path for patrons, there is a, a planned pedestrian path along USA Parkway. There are three main entrances that are planned for vehicles along USA Parkway. Uh, the city officials did conduct a traffic study to investigate the roadway impacts of potential traffic increases for events at this event center. The study concluded that future traffic would operate at acceptable levels with no need for improvements outside of the localized road network. They did provide recommendations for inbound and outbound lanes within the development, and so staff will be sure to review these through the technical advisory committee. I also wanna highlight that there are over 2,400 parking spaces provided on this development. Thompson Thrift has done a comprehensive parking analysis of all the various uses and so uh, we are confident that there is enough parking on site to accommodate all of this development. And then um, as, as Mayor Fadness mentioned, uh, buffering from the existing neighborhoods was a priority as well. And so I just wanna highlight two buffers here. This first is the south buffer. And so um, the improvements that are to be made in this area. It's gonna be a total of 55 feet wide. Um, and then this will include an eight foot tall berm with six foot fencing and evergreens on both sides of that fence. The building itself is set back 180 feet from the nearest rear property line. And then each home itself is set back um, typically about 50 feet from that property line. And then the parking lot itself is set back 80 feet from any residential area. For the east buffer, um, there will also be uh, screening that is provided. So this is gonna be a 30 foot wide buffer with a four foot mound and a six foot tall fence with evergreens. Um, as you can see, the development itself, the building's been oriented to reduce noise impacts and there's been a significant amount of green space with trees and the uh, retention pond that is adjacent to a majority of the personal properties just to make sure that there's a, an increased buffer area without parking and or pedestrians. All lighting on site will include shields and be motion activated to reduce nighttime light pollution. Um, and again, the event center itself, the way it's oriented um, is to reduce noise impact. So most of the 
pedestrian activity is really going to be on the north side of that building. We are holding a neighborhood meeting for any of the adjacent property owners next Monday. Um, it's a Zoom meeting, and so each resident was mailed a notice um, of that neighborhood meeting and then also of the public hearing before plan commission. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but again, this is just for first reading of the PUD. Any other questions at first reading? Todd, I just want to make sure uh, I did get an uh, everybody did emails from Walnut Hills residents, so I just want to make sure they're concerned about privacy and noise and yes. distance and I, from the project to their neighborhood. So if just everything we can do to ensure there's adequate buffering and working with them. Absolutely. Yep, and I reached out to that resident directly. Okay, thank you. to the event center how can you just orient me a little bit to that how wh what is that walkway yeah so right here this is the hotel um, in the existing Fishers district and so they would have two options one would be along USA Parkway itself oh I'm sorry you probably can't see my uh -uh. cursor yeah. there we go oh thank you okay. so here's the hotel yeah. um, so this is the existing development and so someone could either walk along USA Parkway is probably the most direct route right into Fishers to the Commons development or they could walk this is an existing or it's being constructed today by Thompson Thrift it's already been dedicated to the city um, oh sorry my cursor went away there we go um, they could walk internal to this site um, and then it will we'll have pedestrian path connections as well great everything you just designated would be a pedestrian path yes yes thank you thanks I'm assuming too there's going to be wayfinding, right, and signage that directs people towards that yes. area. And I would anticipate all uh, Thompson Thorpe could speak more to this, but probably similar to what the existing Fishers District has. So I, I do have a few questions. I know we have some statements out about the traffic studies that have been done, you know, but I think some residents, from what I've heard in that area, when there's a big event there, you know, how are they gonna be directed once they come out? Are, are most of them gonna be tried to be pumping them onto I-69? Can we provide a little bit more detail on some of the traffic issues to help alleviate some of the residents' concerns? Um, yeah, and um, I don't know if our engineering director has anything else to add, but I know that our parks department, when we have events today at the AMP, um, we hire people to direct traffic, and I think that same scenario would happen with events um, here. And so we'd, we'd be, you know, funneling tr uh, traffic through the appropriate ways. Now, what that looks like, I'm not sure uh, if we figured out those details quite yet. Good evening. Um, yeah, so essentially for each in event, it will depend. That'll kind of dictate how traffic is funneled exiting or to the event itself. Um, I would compare this similar to um, Connor Prairie uh, on Allisonville Road in the sense of Allisonville Road's a main thoroughfare. You have one, maybe two entrances into Connor Prairie for a major event, which is uh, every weekend throughout the year, essentially. Uh, this is gonna have two major interchanges and the, the peak times are gonna be from four to 7.30. Exiting, we're not as concerned, um, but entering, the storage is going to be uh, internal to USA Parkway, so not really impacting our, our actual tra major traffic network, such as the interstate or 106th. Um, on the exiting aspects of it, years ago, a few years ago, Connor Prairie had had some major events that had occurred that were concerts, that were, there was a lot of traffic. We met with them on that particular sit situation and uh, with our PD and fire team um, and tr figured out a better way to manage that traffic and keep it stored internal and the, even on the exiting aspect of that. So it's really gonna be dependent upon the, the type of event it is, when it is, are there other events occurring in the area, um, but we, we feel confident that with our, our team, we'll be able to work with them to accommodate it. 
And then my last thought would be, and I know Mayor Fadness is having some conversations on this, um, regarding the solar aspects, especially on the uh, parking lot lights, can we um, have any solar panels put on those lights to have them make it a little bit more energy efficient? Yeah, we're actually working with a consultant right now to look at opportunities for solar collectively across the community. And if there's opportunities to incorporate that, that makes sense from an economic and environmental, environmental standpoint, we will absolutely do that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think at our last meeting I mentioned something about taking that road out of the 2040 plan. It looks like this kind of fixed that, didn't it? It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I want to thank you guys for looking at the buffers. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the a lot of the neighborhoods um, are a little concerned about that right now. And um, and, and I appreciate ha holding the Monday night meeting. And I'm sure you'll get a few questions. One might be, you know, I had a Summerfield uh, resident ask me, would they be able to walk, you know, where the road was planned, would we be able to possibly have a trail connection there of some type? Um, and about the only other comment that I had was a concern about uh, safety and, you know, crime coming from that, that event center into the neighborhoods. Um, but. Uh, so those are the a couple of the comments that we need to be prepared for. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Anyone else? All right, we have first you. reading. All right, moving on to item 18, R091922L, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Fishers, finding a need for leasing of certain municipal facilities and event center. Yeah, good evening, Council President Zimmerman and Council, Elliot Holcomb, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the next phase of the Fishers District is truly an incredible, exciting project. But before we start enjoying it, uh, we do have some additional business before us this evening. Again, this is just the start of the process. So the first is a resolution on the lease financing of the event center. This process mirrors the Arts and Municipal Complex building that we've been stepping throughout this summer. And this resolution before you accomplishes a few things. One, it provides for finding of deed for the event center. So it's uh, financing necessary for the project. Two, it authorizes the holding of a public hearing. And three, it authorizes the appointment of appraisers for the property to be subject to the proposed lease. So the requirements that we lease assets that cover the payments made for the facility prior to its construction being complete. So for this project, that would be fire stations 91, 94, and 95. Again, this resolution acknowledges this process. It authorizes us to publish notice and hold a public hearing and allows for the appraisal of those three fire stations. Again, it's just the first step in a long process. And I show that here on the right-hand slide of uh, some next meetings. So Town Hall Building Corps would also adopt the resolution. He'd publish that notice, public hearing. We'd get uh, 50 signatures on a petition, bring that back to you guys after the county auditor validates that. We'd have a regularly scheduled finance committee meeting on October 5th. We'd bring it back to the council on October 10th. So this is, again, the first step in that long process. All right. We have a motion, motion to approve. Motion by Pete. I'll second. Second by John. All right, motion by Pete, second by John. Uh, open up for any discussion. Can you explain a little bit more? Like I've got the resolution language in front of me. This is for the, we're calling um, this for the new, For the event center specifically. For the event center, Correct. which is what we were just talking about. Correct. Um, the uh, food and beverage tax is the next item on the it agenda, yep. item, I believe. Yes. So how does this resolution fit into what we're going to talk about next? So I'll talk in length about the food and beverage, uh, specifically how we're going to pay for the entire event center project and specifically the food and beverage. So I've got several slides. We'll cover down on that uh, for you. So what is this resolution? So this is not committing you to any financing tonight. This is just that step in the process for us to post notice for a public hearing and for us to go get 50 signatures on a petition. So this is that first step. This is not committing you to any financial obligations this evening on this resolution. So approving so, the process to move forward in our discussions. Is that basically? That's correct. Um, that's not really how the resolution reads. So maybe I just need a little bit, excuse me, just a few more moments of like section one on the resolution. Um, Common Council finds and determines that a need exists for the project 
the project will be financed, will be public utility benefit to the city, all good. Council further determines the project cannot be acquired, constructed, improved, and equipped from any funds available to the city. So I, I think maybe one way to look at this perhaps is Elliot just go through a second chapter of what he was going to talk about and then we yep. can come back yeah, and actually, let's, let's do that. Yeah, sure. I'm happy I to. think that yeah. would help everything is provide some context. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. So yeah, we'll talk about uh, in detail how we're going to pay for the event center, right? Uh, so we estimate that the annual debt payment for the $170 million project will be $9.7 million. And one of our goals early on was to ensure we do not raise property taxes to fund this project. And in fact, as the finance committee is aware from last week, our 2023 budget presentation proposes a property tax decrease for the second year in a row. So rather, we have a plan in place uh, that diversifies our payment sources in a manner that we feel is fiscally prudent. So I'll step through all four of those for you. So the first one is the Cumulative Capital Development Fund. In past years, we've used this fund primarily for capital improvements to our city buildings. Uh, but thanks to your support, uh, we've overhauled nearly all of our facilities. So we've got a new police sta station, we've got a new fire station headquarters, we've got a new station 93, 96, and 97. We've made significant upgrades to several of our other buildings. Our parks and rec team uh, is housed in the new hub and spoke building, and we're rebuilding our city hall next year. So as such, we're confident uh, that we could redirect this fund towards a new capital project being the event center to the tune of $3.5 million. Next is our pilots or payment in lieu of taxes. So when we acquired HEC utilities, uh, this past year we were confident in our ability to run the combined utility in a very efficient manner. Uh, and we've done that. So, uh, so much so that after fully funding our operations, making our annual debt payment towards that acquisition, investing in capital infrastructure, we have essentially $1.5 million of a new revenue stream uh, that we can transfer from that enterprise fund to the city fund that we can use for this type of investment. Uh, the next is the operations of the actual facilities. We've talked about this a little bit in the past with uh, Mr. Hallett, but this is from OVG, which is a third party consultant. They're leading operator facilities of this size and use throughout the country. They've evaluated how much revenue could reasonably be dedicated uh, to the debt payment. So you fund your operations, you fund your reserves, uh, and conservatively, we'd still have $1.7 million annually uh, towards the debt payment. And so then finally would be the food and beverage tax. So uh, we have uh, contemplated this for a, a decade, really, but we finally found the right project that is worth bringing food and beverage tax before you uh, to match that of our neighbors. So it's investment that directly supports the restaurant industry by driving more customers uh, to them, especially uh, in the first year of operations of up to 125 unique events at the event center. So we'll step through uh, what it is, uh, how we got here today, and where we're going. So the first, uh, and I'll read it specifically, food and beverage applies to transactions in which food or beverages are furnished, prepared, or served by a retail merchant for consumption at a location or on equipment provided by a retail merchant for payments. So that's the legal explanation. Uh, Hamilton County has had a 1% food and beverage tax in place since 2005. So the easy answer is that what has been taxed by Hamilton County for the last 17 years uh, will now have a 1% Fisher's food and beverage applied to it. So uh, what's next year? We will host a separate and special city council. Uh, we've got that scheduled for October 6th. The sole agenda on that will be a public hearing regarding the food and beverage tax. And we'll bring it back to council at our next regularly scheduled meeting on October 10th for a vote. So tonight is again merely the first reading. Uh, some small words on the slide, but I wanna highlight and drive home that in looking at the entire Indy metro area, every municipality already has this in place with the exception of us and Anderson. Uh, so we'd simply be joining our neighbors. Uh, I can see there Carmel, Noblesville, Westfield, Zionsville, uh, and be enacting a municipal food and beverage tax to be on par with the rest of the Indy metro area. Our specifically, I want to note this, uh, can only be used for economic development purposes. So again, the revenue generated from this goes directly and completely to paying for the debt service payment on this event center. So this last slide here is kind of three sections, and I'll cover each one. The first uh, is what I believe that to be the key takeaways from the food and beverage uh, previously discussed, but I'll, I'll, I'll bear repeating here. So the first is enacting this brings us in parity with the rest of the Indy metro area and our neighbors. This revenue goes directly towards paying the debt payment on a facility that will expand our Fisher's district and benefit the tourism and culture, uh, culinary industries and provide incredible entertainment opportunities for our residents. The third is we're doing this again without touching a property tax rate at all. Again, in fact, we are uh, dropping that property tax rate for 2023. 
The last bullet there uh, is actually a really interesting statistic we got from Hamlet County Tourism. Uh, so this past year at the Fisher <coughs> District area specifically, uh, they currently saw a one-to-one -one visitor to resident, resident ratio. So that means that 50% of the food and beverage tax collected in the Fishers District would be from non-Fishers residents. So non-Fishers residents would be helping to pay for the Fishers Event Center by enacting this food and beverage tax. Uh, I'll step down here. Uh, it's getting late. I'm getting hungry, but uh, we'll step down and talk about uh, a few different options here. So an $8 coffee and bagel, right? If you went to Big Apple Bagels, uh, the difference uh, pre-food and beverage to post-food and beverage would be an additional $0.08 cents on that coffee and bagel. If you go to lunch, you grab a sandwich, salad, and a Diet Coke, $20 for lunch, it'd be $20.20, an additional $0.20 cents added to that lunch. And if you take your spouse or loved one out for a, a nice meal, I gotta take my wife out, she's amazing, she deals with me, she deserves a nice meal, right? We get some plays, a nice glass of wine, appetizer, $150, that's an additional $1.50 for me to take my wife out. Stop so. specifying the food like four hours. Yeah, I know, right? Like, yeah, we're getting there, we're getting there. So, yeah, well, I was going for a Pinot because um, I was getting filets, but uh, I'm open to her suggestions. So, um, anyways, uh, I'll close by reviewing the timeline here. So, we opened this up on September 15th at the Finance Committee for discussion. Tonight, again, is just the first reading. We have a Q&A, uh, specifically for uh, a webinar for the restaurant community for September 27th. We have a regularly scheduled finance committee on October 5th. We have the special uh, city council meeting on October 6th, October 6th, excuse me, which will be the public hearing for the food and beverage. And then we'll bring it back again before this body on October 10th. I think that's the end of my slides. Sounds so I'll good. pause there now Sounds if you have any questions or comments. So, Jocelyn, do you have any further on that? I do. I'm, I am concerned about the food and beverage tax. Um, um, I guess just a little conflicted actually I do know this food and beverage tax as you broke it out for like a normal household or getting coffee it's pennies and this is exactly like textbook the kind of project that a food and beverage tax should be funding yeah. absolutely you you know um, my profession is in the tourism industry this is suddenly like a spark of our own tourism economy here in Fishers and that has great potential. Um, my conflict is a couple things. One is it's still a new tax on our residents, even though uh, just north of 146th Street, that tax is being um, charged. Um, and any tax is important, and I need to think through it carefully, so that's just where my head is. Yeah. But I do know that the project itself is exciting and this is the perfect, it's really the perfect opportunity for a food and beverage tax to be utilized in a smart way. So I'm there with that. I'm concerned about the overall um, long-term effort of a tourism economy. We have some, uh, quickly, we have some obstacles in place that affect, we just simply do not have enough frontline hospitality workers. So as we grow this new economy and these opportunities to bring in visitors, that is a great opportunity. However, um, we need to be sure that we're providing a good um, uh, experience for those visitors. And I think all of us have already experienced um, moments in our community today where a dining room is closed or hours are shortened just because we have a lack of, of workers. So that is a much, much bigger issue. But when I think of food and beverage tax and the funding of a new substantial transformative project like this, I also want to think big picture. Yeah. And um, uh, the last comment I'll make is I just learned about this for the first time on Wednesday. So if, um, as a member of this body to be asked to make a decision through this resolution, which is an important statement from mm -hmm. this body. Um, I'm not there yet because I haven't been given enough time to get enough information and learn more about the project and the nuances of the private public partnership and the devils in the details. So I um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to 
talk that through with yep. you, but I don't know if you have anything to add to help resolve that for me, but that's where my head's at today. No, I, uh, it's a fair comment. I, I would say, and this is maybe nuanced, that um, it's, an, a, it's a new tax on people consuming food or beverage in Fishers. It's not a, a tax specifically on Fishers residents, right? So oh, Yes, and as you pointed out, it includes uh, visitors as well. That's right. great. Right. The other thing, quickly, I'll, I'll just mention to you, it does also impact, like, um, um, uh, catering for big events, like if you're doing a wedding reception for 400, right, right. food and beverage tax kicks in there too. Yep. So I, d I just want to add that. Yeah, you know that very well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think uh, Deputy Mayor Holkren mentioned a number of opportunities in the next 20 to 30 days and look forward to sitting down and providing any information you need moving forward. I think, you know, we would never want to back you guys into a corner and make decisions with limited information. I think as Elliot mentioned earlier, this document dies if down the road there's no additional movement on food and beverage or the ability to progress this prog uh, project. So tonight, from a political perspective, I understand making the, the vote from a statement standpoint, but ultimately it has no financial ramifications and you ultimately will vote in October on this agenda item. But to be, to, to be fidu you know, from a financial perspective, we wanna make sure that we're progressing things because we are living in an interest rate climate that isn't fantastic. And so we wanna start these processes, both the land planning and also the financial side of things. But we commit to you over the next uh, several days to provide any information you may need moving forward. Any other questions or comments? I, I have a, a question here. I just want to make sure that I understand this. So today, it's a one-to-one -one ratio of the people that are paying bills, paying food bills within you know the district. My question is, as, as we grow this out, do we have any idea as to, will that remain as one-to-one? -one? Will it go for people from outside of Fishers? Because the way I'm seeing this, if we're bringing people into the fuel games or to a concert, uh, there's going to be yeah. a greater I, percentage of this tax I, I is going to be coming from. I would defer of to uh, Brenda Myers at the Visitors Bureau. We could go back and ask her to model that, given what we're planning on doing in the calendar. And my guess is, with her team, they could probably bring some projections back that we can share with everyone as to, it's one to one today, what do we think that could be moving forward? But you know, anecdotally, I would think it's going to draw more people from a variety of places, but my guess is that the tourism industry has some pretty sophisticated modeling that they can do to, to demonstrate that. I highly rec recommend that because the economic impact of tourism is getting visitors to come and spend more, right? right? We don't want them to just go to a fuel game and go home. We do want them to stay and eat and shop and go to Conner Prairie and right like Absolutely. and local businesses. So that's the power of this economy that we're almost building. So it is very exciting. I'm I'm very intrigued by it. And I just frankly I'm here to tell you I just want to be sure we do it right. And and to your point, if I may, um, there's there's a limit to how many visitors you can bring in. What's going to happen is. Fisher's residents, I mean, just capacity. We're talking capacity here. And either it's workers that's gonna hold up that capacity or just like the number of restaurants we have or shops we have that are just not going to be able to grow along with this economy. So we wanna do it right. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. and make the most of it. It's no, a great right. opportunity. And I think, Selena, I think your hypothesis is on sound footing in that I think it's uh, citywide in Fisher's, it's a three to one ratio. So uh, about 25% uh, of folks spending on food and beverage in Fishers are non-Fishers residents. But in the district specifically, it's a 50-50 split, which is suggesting that that's a destination, right? And so as we expand that destination, we put a <coughs> world-class event center there, I certainly think that uh, more non-Fishers residents will be attracted to that place and spending money there. So you're absolutely, I think, on sound footing with that logic. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Right. I, I think we can we can <clears throat> see that our our city is changing and we're becoming a destination with Andretti coming here. I mean, we we have an opportunity here that is like no other. And uh, the Fishers District, I mean, they're busting at the seams that the business owners are. You know, 1933, they're gonna they're gonna start one in Carmel. So I, there's success there, and I think. Um, you know, this is going to be just as successful as well. So, 
Anyone else? All right, we had. Great job, Elliot. Thank you. I guess Jeff Davis had to kick. Okay, he's good. <laughs> he said he's all good, right, with everything. He all, did. Right. all right. Great job. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Yeah. All right, we had a motion by Pete, if I remember correctly, and a second by John. Uh, Jennifer, will you uh, hold the roll call, please? It's on item 18. Item 18. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Koval. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. Selena Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vare. I'm a nay, and I'm going to just add the comment. It's fully because I hadn't had, I wasn't given the uh, adequate amount of time to vet the project and the impacts. Nay. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Eight to one, it passes. All right, thank you. Moving on to item 991922J, an ordinance of the City of Fishers, Hamilton County, Indiana, adopting the City of Fishers food and beverage tax. It is a first reading. So I think you just went over everything. You just there. went over everything. So I'm going to give it a first reading yes. and then let any other comments come out. First reading, does anybody else have any additional comments to what we just talked about? All right, we have first reading. Thank you very much. And we're okay to move on with item 20. We're past seven o'clock, so I, I did remember that from the beginning, a couple hours ago. Um, I, uh, item 20, R091922A, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Fishers approving execution of the lease of the Fishers Town Hall Building Corporation. For the record, Lisa Bradford, City Controller. The item before you is the final step to completing our financing for the Fishers Arts and Municipal Complex. If you'll recall, you have seen this in June and July. So in that time, you previously received petitions requesting the leasing of certain facilities to finance the arts and municipal complex. Um, we previously made a determination that the financing of this project is necessary. So tonight, after the public hearing, the council will approve the execution of a lease to finance this project with the Town Hall Building Corporation. The resolution also approves the execution of the lease and the authorizes the actions to complete the financing for City Hall. As you'll recall, this is a not to exceed um, bond in the amount of about $17.4 million. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and open us up for public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this item alone? Step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, I'll close the public hearing. And I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second by Selena. Open it up for discussion. Do we have any questions or comments? Okay, Jennifer, we do roll call, please. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Koval. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. Selena Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vare. Aye. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 21, R091922B. All right, for the record, the next two items, 21 and 22, relate to the city's obligations under a project agreement that with uh, CRG that was approved at the February 2022 city council meeting. So. This resolution provides the council's approval of a creation of a new allocation area and an amendment to the economic development plan, including the potential to create additional allocation areas. The item before you has been approved by both the Redevelopment Commission and the Plan Commission have approved the designation. So what this item essentially does is allow us to create this allocation area to capture the tax increment financing and therefore that tax increment financing will be used to pay the debt service on item 22, which is the bond ordinance. Okay, motion to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second by John. Open it up for discussion. Any questions or comments? Roll call, please. 
Todd Zimmerman. Abstain. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Coble. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. Talina Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vare. Aye. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item 22, 091922A. All right, this is the first reading of the bond ordinance. And per the project agreement, this will allow the issuance of bonds uh, in a not to exceed amount of $23 million. As a reminder, the total project investment is estimated to be about $98 million for this project. A uh, portion of the proceeds will be used to construct the roundabout at 96th Street and Allisonville Road. And as we discussed at Finance Committee, but it'll, it'll bear repeating, um, similar to the bonds that will be issued for the Andretti project, these are bonds that the developer will buy themselves. So they're essentially considered conduit debt obligations. So they aren't considered obligations of the city. They are truly the responsibility of the developer. They show on um, our financial statements purely as a footnote, but any obligations related to them are truly the obligation of the developer themselves. Give it a first reading. Okay, first reading. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to item 23, R091922C. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about 23, 24, and 25 together since they're all kind of interrelated. Um, do we have to hold public hearings separately on all of them? Okay, so we'll hold public hearings separately on all of them. But the next three items relate to additional appropriations related to the city's purchase of Hamilton Southeastern Utilities on December 29th of 2021. So at the time when we contemplated our 2022 budget, the discussion to acquire HSC was in full swing, but we did not account for the combined operations in the sewer budget. So either the operating uh, fund or the bond and interest fund. So item 23 is the additional appropriations for the sewer operating fund. And this will allow the combined utility to continue its operations. As we've mentioned, it does include the payment uh, and the payment of lieu of taxes, the pilot payment in that amount. Item 24 is an additional appropriation to pay the debt service on the revenue bond for the acquisition. And then item 25, as part of the acquisition of HSE utilities, we um, took on some new sanitary sewer inspections. And so what happens is, is the engineering team is out there looking at these and essentially these fees, it's meant to be almost a zero sum fund where our revenues go out to pay these inspection fees. And so that allows us to appropriate some of the funding we've already received this year to pay for some of those costs. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, go one by one here for public hearings and then chime in if you have any questions in between those, all right? Uh, item, so this will be a public hearing for item 23. It's R091922C. I'm gonna open up for public hearing. If you're wishing to speak on this item, please step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, I'll close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, motion by Pete. Second. Second by Selena. A roll call, please. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Coble. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. Talina Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vare. Aye. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Motion passes. All right, we'll go ahead and open a public hearing for item 24R09. 1922D. Open up for public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak, step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, I'll close the public hearing. And I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second by John. Go ahead and roll call, please. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. 
Pete Peterson? Yes. Cecilia Coble? Aye. Brad DeRamer? Aye. Lena Stoller? Aye. Jocelyn Vayer? Aye. Crystal Newman? Aye. David Giffel? Aye. Motion passes. When those lights get really bright, is that a signal for me to do something? It's on a timer. It's just waiting for you. When I turn their brights on, I'm like, man, it's, it's all right. All right, item 25. This will be public hearing for item 25, R091922E. Open up for public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak, step forward, state your name at an address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, I'll close the public hearing. And I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Pete. Second. Second. Second by Selena. Go ahead and roll call on item 25, please. Todd Zimmerman. Aye. John Weingart. Aye. Pete Peterson. Yes. Cecilia Coble. Aye. Brad DeRamer. Aye. Selena Stoller. Aye. Jocelyn Vayer. Crystal Newman. Aye. David Giffel. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 26. We're talking about our municipal budget. 091922. Request to approve the city of Fishers 2023 budget. Mayor Fedman. Thank you, Council President Zimmerman. Uh, this is my 16th budget uh, presentation, I think. Uh, I, I won't take offense to the fact that most people have left already yeah. after all the exciting projects and now we're on to the budget. Um, but I do think it's an equally important story to tell. Uh, and first and foremost, I have to thank all the people that have worked to get to this point. Um, Deputy Mayor Elliot Holcren, our controller Lisa Bradford, Beth Hampshire from our controller's office, and all of these folks sitting in the front row, our department heads, make the actual budgeting process uh, very easy for our team. Every year, we tell them we have to live within the confines of X, and every year they deliver exceptional value uh, with the resources that they have. So tonight, I'm going to walk you through uh, briefly the budget. If I hit the wrong button, I apologize, Tracy. What's that? I may. All right, Tracy. <laughs> it's been a little ornery too, so it might be. Well, there's like 42 different uh, presentations right. up here at the moment. Perfect. Yeah, it's frozen. Good times. User error. I don't think so. Ultimately, this uh, budget process that we go through is really about transparency, communi communicating effectively, not only to the fiscal body, but to our residents about what it is we're doing, what are our priorities, and how are we allocating resources to achieve those priorities. Uh, we really start the budget process as early as April or May. The folks that are sitting here, our department heads and their teams, we start setting out priorities in the April-May timeframe, and they have to work internally to meet those obligations or those goals. And then ultimately we start having conversations with the finance committee. And I appreciate council, uh, council member Weingart leading the finance committee. Uh, this year we've had a lot of productive conversations uh, with the entire team on the finance committee, just discussing frankly, uh, what are those priorities and how are we accomplishing those? You can see here on August 8th, we met with a spe special finance committee really talking about uh, the 2023 budget from a revenues perspective, I've always been of the belief that it's a little hard to talk about expenditures if you don't know how much money you're actually bringing in. And so we really wanted to make sure that we understood uh, where our revenues stood. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight because uh, I do think it's important. It's kind of a dynamic uh, period of time for us when it comes to revenues and it has had uh, pretty significant implications when we talk about our cash reserves. And then ultimately we posted uh, on our website uh, we had a media advisory briefing, and this is something we've done for years. Larry, thank you for always being there. Uh, but we, we want to sit down with the, the reporters and talk to them uh, in detail about what it is I'm going to be presenting in front of you so that there are no questions for the community at large uh, as to what it is we're doing. Ultimately, this led up to our last finance committee meeting where we had the discussion and really got the finance committee um, comfortable with where we stood from a budget perspective. Really. The backbone of our financial management system has been our controller's office 
and our desire to really instill best management practices. And these are some pretty extraordinary uh, stats you see here. S&P reaffirmed us as a AAA bond rated community. We have uh, received the GFOA Association's uh, academic, or excuse me, certificate of achievement uh, 30 some years in a row. Uh, and also the budget, we're in our 15th year uh, of receiving a distinguished budget presentation award. What that really means is that our peers have reviewed the documents that we put together and the information that we put together and believe that we have comprehensively communicated to our public how we are spending our dollars and what are our priorities. So let's get to the actual budget for 2023. I would tell you in my 15 years of doing this, uh, this budget is um, right down the middle. Uh, it is um, meeting all of our obligations, investing in the appropriate places for the future, and really de deriving a significant value to the taxpayers. Um, the 2023 budget overall, operations and capital, so your operating dollars as well as your capital investments, will be approximately $110.6 million. With the debt service is 33.9 million. For those of you that are keeping track of this, you'll see a, a fairly marked increase in the amount of debt service payments. Part of that is due to the fact we bought a sewer utility. And so there's a big debt payment that comes along with paying that. For a total budget of $144.5 million and a cash reserve of $57.5 million. Now this is all funds combined. Most of the time we talk about the general fund. This is all of our funds, including our enterprise funds. And to that point, as we look here, uh, you can see the different, I like to call them buckets of money, but other people would call them funds. If you recall, our, our largest fund is the, the blue one on the bottom, that is our general fund. And then we have a variety of miscellaneous funds uh, besides that. The budget uh, we often talk about, is it a, a structurally sound budget? Are we spending more money than we're bringing in? Uh, are we having a cash surplus? And this year, our proposed budget is in line. It is balanced to the extent that we actually are generating a surplus of funds. And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. And one might ask, well, why are we having a surplus of cash? And, and why is that accruing in our city's coffers? And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that here briefly. Uh, but before we get to that, what this budget does include is a 4% raise for all of our employees and elected officials. Um, on top of that, for all of our employees, but not elected officials, given the inflation we're proposing, that, yeah, sorry, Brad, but I hear Social Security is getting a big bump, so you're going to be fine. <laughs> um, so there's a 3% one-time cost of living bonus that we feel is appropriate. The reason we're doing this versus raising the pension base is none of us know what inflation is going to do next year or the year after that or the year after that. And although we would love to give our employees 7, 10, 12, 14% increases is because they definitely work very hard for us each and every day. We have to be very careful about what kind of commitments we make for the long term. I've always been of the opinion if you're going to offer our employees something today, you better financially plan to be able to do it next year and the year after that and the year after that. It's our responsibility. They're making life choices on that. So I take that very, very seriously. And so this 3% one time cost of living adjustment is really just that. And we'll revisit it next year and, and decide where we go from here. But for now, it's a one-time cash allotment. The budget also includes staffing needs. Uh, we have a big park opening up next year. We're very excited about Geist Waterfront Park, but we have to staff that appropriately. We're gonna have hundreds of kids and families out swimming. We gotta have the lifeguards and the appropriate people to manage those lifeguards to make sure it's a safe place. And when we build a park like that, it takes a lot of maintenance. So we're gonna have to have a Department of Public Works staffing to meet the needs of that as well. And then you also see here we're adding uh, police, uh, civilian community information uh, position. This is someone that's going to really be engaged in the community in a significant way. It's important to note, I think this will be a going trend, this is a civilian. This is not a sworn officer, but rather we think we can gain a lot of uh, great skill sets from individuals that want to come be a part of the law enforcement agency, but not necessarily carry a gun. And I think that's going to be a continuing trend that you see in law enforcement moving forward. Uh, here you see uh, just generally how we divvy up the money. Um, one of the things that you'll note here, uh, personnel costs have increased uh, relatively significantly from 2022 to 2023. A couple things that I would add there is, if you recall last year, you guys appropriated the amount of money needed to fund firefighters for half the year for Station 97. Uh, so we brought that recruit class in. In fact, uh, just the other day we got to go look at, uh, they were training in City Hall. 
So there's 17, I think, Chief, is that right? 17 in recruit class currently uh, that will, farm, uh, will staff Station 97 when it comes online in January. So in 2022, we only funded a half of a year for those firefighters. In 2023, I'm sure they would appreciate if we paid their full salary for the entire year. And so that's why you see a pretty significant increase in the amount of funding for personnel services from 22 to 23. One thing I did want to point out here, a, a great story of kind of innovation on controlling personnel costs is our, our uh, health insurance. So our employees and led by our department heads here, led our people through some change recently in our benefits where we have an exclusive contract with community health and we were able to lock that contract in for five years with a 3% increase each year and only a 3% increase each year. And I just read an article recently where healthcare inflation is anywhere between eight to 12% across the board. So we know when we budget that healthcare cost in our budget for 2023, that's not a projection, that's not a guess. That is the actual cost of healthcare to deliver to our employees for this upcoming year. And we know that five years out, which is an extraordinary opportunity for us and really couldn't have been done without the leadership of our department heads helping their people get through that change because changing benefits can be can be a challenge at times. This just gives you uh, an example of how we have to manage our fixed costs. You know, people are expensive. Uh, they're our most precious asset in our organization. They're the most valuable asset in our organization. So the 70, 75% of our funding going to those people uh, doesn't cause me alarm, but it's something we have to manage. If that number continues to creep up to 78, 82, 84%, what that really means is you're reducing your discretionary spending to be able to spend on other things like roads, parks, buildings, things of that nature. Um, when we talk about efficiency, I think it's important just for all of you to understand just what our uh, men and women are doing within our organization. So I thought this was a really great uh, stat. Um, so if you look at the population that uh, represents the city of Fishers, Carmel, Noblesville, and Westfield, and then we look at the total number of employees that we have in our organizations collectively. If you look at that, we have by far are the most efficient pound for pound in terms of delivering services uh, to, our, to our community, uh, which I think is just a testament to the hard work of the men and women within our organization. And because of that fact, and because of frankly a history of, of financial management, uh, it, this is a chart of property tax rates here in Hamilton County. On the far right, I would orientate you because it's hard to see. Um, Sheridan and Arcadia have a dollar thirty-three and a dollar nineteen tax rates. That's on the far right. If you're looking at this chart, on the far left, you have Cicero at fifty-eight cents, and we're the next one over. So the city of Fishers, from a value proposition, you see a significant bang for your buck. Uh, within Hamilton County. The only community lower than us from a municipal tax rate is Cicero. When we take a step back and we look at the 10 largest cities in Indiana, as you can see on the far right, that's Gary, $4.50 is our municipal tax rate. Um, and then on the far left, again, the top uh, largest communities in the state of Indiana, we are on the far left. The proposed tax rate for the city of Fishers is 71 0.15 cents if proposed as a reduction. So that just gives you an idea, again, of all the investments that we've talked about tonight, all the growth, all the ability to provide new amenities, we're doing that at a tax rate that is exponentially lower than our counterparts throughout the state of Indiana. So I wanna to touch on this cash reserve or cash surplus conversation that's uh, out there. Here, you see that light blue chart? That is Carmel's, the light blue bar. That is the city of Carmel's uh, income tax revenue. So they received, let's look at 2023, about $46.8 million. Uh, and ours is a dark blue. We receive about $37.227 million. Now, what you've noticed on this bar chart is even though income tax revenue has grown over the last few years, Carmel's has remained flat whereas the cities of Fishers, city of Fishers has moved up in both 2021 and 2023. The reason being is we were able to go to the state house and identify just the disparity. So if you go back to 2019, you can see, even though we're the same population, 
the massive disparity between Carmel and Fishers when it comes to income tax collection. I will not beat a dead horse here because I know we've been over this many, many times, um, but this is, a, this is a challenge for us to be funded at 15 to $20 million less than a community right next door that has the exact same population and a slightly higher median household income is a formulaic issue that needs to be addressed. Now we were able to address it for the last three years, but that's a temporary change, a temporary adjustment. So as you saw our blue, the dark blue jump up in revenue, that's a temporary adjustment. And so one of the things that Deputy Mayor, Hul Deputy Mayor Hulker and I were very concerned about is starting to spend money or commit dollars year in and year out for what is really temporary money. And so a lot of that money we have just put aside in the, in the cash balance. And that's where you see, and you could put these bar charts together and you would start to see how they line up. In 2021, 2022, and 2023, you see our cash balances continuing to increase. Well, the reason behind that is we're getting one-time money shifted over from Carmel due to the state formula change over that three-year three, three period. And so we need to be very, very thoughtful about how we want to spend that money because it really is kind of one-time money. We certainly need to continue to pursue an adjustment in the formula because in reality, if we go back one slide, that dark blue and light blue, those bars should be almost identical in terms of revenue distribution, but they're not. So that's something we need to continue to work on at a legislative standpoint. But here you see, again, our cash balances continue to grow and we need to have ongoing discussions and I think we spoke at the finance committee about just continuing the dialogue on that. Uh, but as you can see, we have a lot of exciting projects coming up and we also are in a, a time period of inflation. So we wanna make sure that we have dollars available to be able to tap into that because we don't wanna go below that dark blue line. That dark blue line demonstrates what we have committed to from a financial policy standpoint. We don't ever wanna find ourselves in a position where we're dipping into reserve policies uh, below that 50% of current year's property tax revenue. So beyond operations, beyond staffing, talk a little bit about just an unprecedented investment, frankly, in local roads. Uh, Jason Taylor and his team in the engineering's office is gonna be very busy. Uh, we're gonna have over $12 million in local uh, funds estimated to be invested in our infrastructure. Um, a lot of that has to do with construction, but also just frankly, a pretty strong resurfacing program. This year, we were able to put a lot of money on the streets to repave roads. I think you guys have seen a marked difference in just the number of neighborhoods that we're able to get out there and really repave, as well as key corridors. You're seeing that again next year with an anticipated $4 million of road resurfacing, as well as a lot of the road projects we've been talking about for some time. Cumberland Road, uh, the widening of Cumberland Road, finishing of the Nickel Plate Trail, Geist Greenway, uh, Hoosier Road Roundabout and 106th Street, 126th and Southeastern. So a very, very busy year when it comes to road infrastructure. Uh, and then beyond just what we're building, uh, Jason and his team will also be working on a variety of designs and progressing those designs so that we can build them in the years after that. So uh, very, very busy time when it comes to our in, uh, road infrastructure. And I think it's important to note that even though we're investing 10 to $12 million in our roads, uh, because of Jason and Mackie and the entire team in engineering, uh, we were able to receive over $10 million of federal funds to go build. So this is really leveraging our local dollars and to, to make the federal dollars work for us. Uh, one of the conversations we've had multiple times uh, is about private roads. And I know Mike Colby's here tonight. Oh, yeah. There you go, Mike. A little shout out to you. Um, we are focused on this. We are currently in in-depth conversations with uh, two different uh, road sections currently uh, about a barrel law and we're working through that. Uh, so far, the businesses have been uh, amenable to working forward on this project. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we have staff dedicated to this as we speak. Uh, Jason's been working closely to get engineer estimates so that we can get this moving. And then also what is important for you to note, although not necessarily a fiscal item, uh, we did go to Board of Works recently and adopted a policy on what roads would be deemed potentially public and which ones would stay uh, private. And we're gonna bring that to a work session in the near future to talk, talk through as well. Um, just some kind of random capital budget items, but nonetheless, really important. One of the things I love about my job here is just the, the complete variety and diversity of work. Uh, as you can see on the top one, um, we were excited. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hulkern worked hard 
to identify additional funding so that we could buy our all new self-contained breathing apparatus for our firemen. So if you see them walking into a fire, that mask that they have in, the oxygen system that goes with it, uh, those are out of date and uh, are no longer um, maintained by the manufacturer. And so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna replace all of those. And that is not an insignificant, we're talking millions of dollars to be able to get that accomplished and we're gonna be able to do that. Uh, bike share stations, makers, playground equipment, agri park improvements, uh, DPW facility, backup uh, uh, generators, um, renovations to some of our older fire stations, all of those are uh, included in this budget for 2023. One of the things that I spoke to the finance committee about this, one of the things we do have to keep our eye on, um, and it may seem a little bit monotonous, but our fleet uh, package, you know, each and every year we try to do our best. Tabitha does a wonderful job as our fleet director maintaining our assets, but the procurement world right now for vehicles has just gotten uh, crazy. I think um, a fire fire ladder truck we used to be able to buy for, I think, 800000 Is that right? And now what is it? So it went up $700,000 in the last two years. $700,000. And so, you know, we're, we still have to put the right equipment in our people's hands to make sure that they're safe and effective at their job. But we're going to have to continue to try to get creative and, and do all that we can. And the other thing to note is if we were to um, order a ladder truck today, it'd be 20, more than 24 months before we would even receive it. Uh, so this is just something for all of you uh, to keep an eye on. And an another great argument for why we have the adequate cash reserves that we do, because who knows how long this inflation component is going to last. Um, just in closing, I would tell you that uh, tonight is a public hearing and our first reading. We anticipate bringing this back at the um, October council meeting for adoption. And uh, again, I just could not be more excited to be here tonight in the position that we are as a community, seeing a billion dollars of growth, being able to reduce our property tax rate, and just seeing a ton of potential for our community and investing in ourselves has always, always, always paid off. And so thank you all for your time uh, tonight, and I would be happy to entertain any questions either before or after the public hearing. Let's go ahead and open up for public hearing <clears throat> on the F City of Fishers 2023 budget, item 091922. Anyone wishing to speak, step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Good evening. Uh, Michael Colby, 7105 Cold Lake Drive. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't get up and speak when you talk about private roads. Um, I, I just have a request. When you take a road into the inventory, could you name it Colby Drive or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I have is it, it appeared earlier in the meeting that we're having another tax uh, that's probably going to come upon us. That's the food and beverage tax. And I'll reserve my comment on that at, at the appropriate time. But under the revenue streams, we have a wheel tax. And I didn't see anything particular about that. I just want to know where we are with that, how much money that brings in, what does it contribute to the community? And with some of the uh, uh, resources that are coming in from our good friends in DC, uh, is there money for infrastructure? And maybe we could take a look at reducing or eliminating that wheel tax. Um, that's my comments, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take in consideration the road naming, Mike. Pardon me. We'll take in consideration naming a road something. Make sure it's a major thoroughfare. Major thoroughfare. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak, step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no one stepping forward, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Yeah, I'll give it a first reading. And, and on the wheel tax, is a, that is a good question, yeah. Mayor, because Absolutely. I get this a lot of times. First of all, they, they ask, is it per wheel? And I have to explain it's not per wheel. Um, oh. Come on up, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, want, Chris. Did you want to speak? Yep. Oh, okay. Come on up. Come on up. Good evening, all. Well, <clears throat> my name is uh, Theodore Ted Moran. I only recognize one member on the council since the last time that I uh, presented for the annexation 
anti-annexation, uh, which we feel, always felt, that we were betrayed on that. But nonetheless, I'm not going to go into that in detail. Uh, I lived uh, at uh, 12295 Ridgeside Road on the water at Geist and just recently moved to uh, 13021 Duval Drive in Gray Eagle. I understand that there is a movement afoot to break up Gray Eagle. I don't know any of the details. This is the first, this is the first I've heard about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, this afternoon. Sir, this is a public hearing for the budget. Are you speaking about the budget or are you speaking about an item later Pardon? on? This is a public hearing for our municipal budget. If you have comments on other matters, you can save those for the end of the meeting. This is just with respect to our budget that the mayor presented. Okay. So well, if, you, if you have comments on, on things other than the budget, there'll be a time at the end of the meeting for those. At the end of this uh -huh. meeting? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. We'll give you that time wait, at the end. I'll okay. wait until then. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you, sir. So, um, I can, I can back to it. wheel tax. Yeah. If you yeah. So it generates approximately $2 million a year. It's grown slightly every year, but, but not a significant amount. Uh, and every dollar of that goes to either road resurfacing or uh, road projects. Uh, we spend every dollar that comes in the year, goes right back out on the roads um, every year. Okay. And we see the continued need for those funds. What Absolutely. would happen if we... Um, well, so I think it's important to note, and unfortunately this is true, the federal government uh, programs, including even today and the long-held programs of the MPO where we get a lot of the federal funds that I mentioned earlier, are almost exclusively for uh, capacity expansion. It's not to go repave someone's neighborhood road. And so what that $2 million will always be used for, one way or another, is to maintain the assets we already have. It's not necessarily for building the next new interchange and things of that nature. We'll, we'll pursue those federal funds, but those are almost exclusively not for maintenance. Um, anyone else have any comments, I, questions? I have a question here. Uh, deal with this on the Nickel Plate Review Committee. Along the trail, um, you're starting to see businesses put up no public restrooms, and oh. we're starting to get people do the three-year-old pee-pee dance <laughs> down the trail. Yeah. Um, is there any way that we can work in to put public restrooms along the trail? It is a growing concern of ours uh, and something we need to look at. I know, Megan, we've had conversations of working with some of our private development that's coming. Can we partner with them to create a restroom facility on the trail? Because as of right now, there are no public restrooms on the trail. So. That's certainly something we'd work on. I think I'd prefer to do it incorporated into some other development, uh, potentially, and we've got a lot of that going on, um, but that's something we can work on for sure. Okay. We need to, yeah, absolutely. Brad? Um, based that um, we're gonna be here for the next year, correct? Uh, yes. Could we increase Tracy's budget? Yes, for we're, we're lights and <laughs> Tracy, Tracy we're, we're working on that as we speak. He doesn't need any more lights. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Anything we're, else I'm yeah. fine with, I'm, I'm a no on the lights. We're, we're going to get Tracy some contractual help uh, so that he's not running Reagan on these things. Anyone else have any questions? First of all, I'd like to commend Mayor Fadness and Lisa and the administration. Just, I have found year after year the budget process becomes more open, more detailed. And I would say I really thought that the process this year and the multiple meetings um, really was very effective. So Good. thank you and thanks for the whole team of department heads. I thought it was very effective. Um, uh, but I have to ask if, um, and probably this would happen tonight or tomorrow, that there's a web page uh, dedicated to the municipal budget. That'll be updated with this presentation. It sure will. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> well, it's a good presentation. Thanks. So let's make sure um, citizens get yep. to see it. 
Um, speaking of citizens, I do have two comments or just an opportunity. The two things that I hear most commonly from citizens that were not, I, I don't believe were addressed in the presentation was, no surprise, State Road 37, mm -hmm. and also access to the Nickel Plate Trail. Not the trail itself, but sidewalks that lead into it. Can you speak about both of those items yeah. and how they fit in the budget or future budgets? Yeah, great. Uh, State Road 37, 141st Street specifically, the other two we cut the ribbon on, right. so we have one interchange left to go. Um, we continue to value engineer, uh, we continue to talk to our partners. Uh, we think we're probably bidding in the January, February timeframe potentially. Yeah, one of the strategies, and I think we talked about this in the finance committee, is um, INDOT is anticipating their largest bid letting in history next year, and so we're trying to figure out when is the best time for us to bid so that we get favorable pricing. But we, I compliment Jason and his team. They've already been able to cut millions of dollars out of that cost estimate just by value engineering, and uh, we look to hopefully get you some concrete numbers in the upcoming fiscal year. And those will be programmed into future 2024, 25, 26. And we do anticipate that in our tax rate projections. So okay. we do have that. Um, your other question, I'm sorry, was? Um, access to trails. Access to trails. So I think we spoke about this. Um, this upcoming year, a lot of our resources around trails are gonna be tied up in finishing the Geist Greenway. So we're gonna have two main north-south corridors, obviously the Nickel Plate Trail, next one being uh, the Geist Greenway. After this year, I anticipate freeing up the funds that we were using to build those two main corridors to then start connecting everyone. It's been awesome to see the demand mm -hmm. for these new trails. Um, we just need to button them up so then we can go take those funds and start tying more and more people to those backbones. So I, ho I hope people can exercise a little bit of patience as we try to finish off the Geist Greenway this upcoming year and then in 2024 really start to focus on those trail connections. Okay. Um, it's a good budget. Do you want to, um, I'm sorry, I just thought of one last thing. Yeah, sure. Um, I, and I always like to put a fine point on this. Very happy to see the tax rate go down yes. a little bit, but um, I know that doesn't necessarily equate to a lower property tax bill for our citizens. And I just want to point that, I just want to yes. make that clear. It, it, it equates to certainly a lesser bill than it could have been. Um, but I agree with you that there are really two things I complain about. One are the, all the other taxing entities. And then secondly is just assessed value growth. We're in a time of rapid assessed value growth, so that also has an impact. One other thing I would just touch on real quickly, I forgot to mention in here, uh, we do have funding available for our flock cameras. Cecilia, you had mentioned that as an emphasis for uh, law enforcement. And we were able to... Uh, build out Chief Gephardt's next phase of the flock cameras. It's been a very popular program. So I believe there's 10 cameras uh, slotted for that as well. And uh, appreciate your guys' time tonight. Again, this is a process. We'll see you again at the Finance Committee and ultimately at the October Council Meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, anyone else uh, have questions? I just, I just want to uh, acknowledge all the department heads. You, you, every year you, you do an amazing job with your team, with our city, I, I just want to thank you since you're all here, and it, you know we we're, we should be proud of of what we are um, proposing again for 2023 with with this budget. And I know um, you all work very very hard, so I appreciate everything you've done to uh, look at your budgets and and um, make sure we have value for what we're you know putting out. Um, and then I want to commend also. Uh, Jason Taylor because you know again you always all of you where you you all go in and you try to match federal funding state funding to leverage our money with other opportunities and you guys do an amazing job time and time again in all departments to to really look at what's out there and capture that and and leverage that so I, pre I appreciate it and thank you anyone else with a question or questions or comments First reading, did we? Yes, we All did. Right, we did. All right, moving on to item 27091922G, a request to approve the city of Fisher's uh, 2023 salary ordinance. First reading. Good evening, uh, Ethan Lee, Director of Human Resources. I'm here to present the first reading of the city's 2023 salary ordinance. Uh, Indiana Code requires that the city establish, uh, or the legislative body 
uh, established by ordinance, uh, the annual compensation for each city position title. Uh, the city has, as before, chosen to elect a biweekly salary schedule to establish the maximum salary uh, for each position under such uh, ordinance. Um, all the pr proposed changes to our current salary ordinance uh, either have no financial impact uh, or have been included, of course, in the 2023 uh, proposed budget. Uh, other than adjusting for the proposed 4% uh, employee wage increase, these changes are intended really just to update uh, position titles uh, and salary grades to better align with our uh, current roles and to maintain competitive with market and industry standards. So if you will, uh, I'll, uh, I'll allow me to read out those uh, changes for 2023. Um, first of all, administration uh, adding a new position title of customer service specialist and the health department adding a new position title of cultural culture of health ambassador. Planning and Zoning Department changed the Planner 1 and Planner 2 to Planner and Senior Planner, respectively, and eliminate the Planner 3 title. And Parks add new position titles of Aquatics Manager and Director of Recreation and Wellness. Community and Public Relations move the Director of Community and PR to a higher salary grade. Engineering Department move Director of Engineering to a higher salary grade. Public Works move Assistant Superintendent of Maintenance to a higher salary grade. Police Department uh, add new specialty pay categories of bilingual and on-call specialty pay. Uh, also increase the specialty existing specialty pay of dive team and emergency response team and increase the clothing allowance again for the Police Department. And uh, any changes to the to the 23 budget uh, that would affect the salary ordinance uh, will of course bring uh, the revised version of that to the uh, uh, October meeting uh, for, for final review. Any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer at this time. Any questions? I'll give it a first reading. Okay, Brian, go ahead. Uh, since I represent the older generation, do I get a bigger raise than the rest of these guys? <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> Special Brad raise. Anybody else? Questions or comments? All right, we have first reading, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to 28091922H. Good evening, Council. Uh, for the record, Chris Greisel, City Attorney, and we're here tonight to have a first reading of our Council redistricting process. This is the first reading. Uh, we will bring these back in October after soliciting any comments and feedback from you. I thought what I would do uh, to begin before uh, showing and displaying these maps is to give you an overview of state and federal law first to kind of paint the context of where we're at. So. As you all know, standing up here today, under Indiana law, a legislative body of a second class city is divided into six districts with three at large members. And in accordance with Indiana Code section 36 4 6 3, the legislative body has to adopt an ordinance to divide those districts, those six districts, to be composed of contiguous territory, except for territory that is not contiguous to any other part of the city, has to be reasonably compact. They have to not cross precinct boundary lines except as provided under Indiana law and contain as nearly as possible equal population. The division of the legislative districts uh, shall be made during the second year after a federal decennial census. So we had a federal decennial census in 2020, hence why we're here in 2022 to talk about this process. Uh, in accordance with Indiana code section 3-11-1.5-32, the legislative body of a um, municipality may not change the boundaries of a district after November 8th of the year preceding the year in which a municipal election is to be held, except to assign territory uh, to a municipal legislative body district through an annexation ordinance. For purposes of statutes relating to the drawing of boundaries of municipal legislative districts, the political subdivision shall use population as reported by the most recent federal decennial census. And this is an important note because every time we've gone through this redistricting process, um, the population numbers reflect a snapshot in time, right? They're a, that's already passed. So the numbers don't reflect our current population as we sit here today, but they reflect our population based on the 2020 federal census numbers with adjustments that the state and the county then make to redrawing the precinct boundaries. With respect to federal law, um, 
the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution contains a principle referred to as the one vote, one principle, one vote, one person principle. <coughs> and this principle was most recently examined in 2016 by the United States Supreme Court where the late Justin Ginsburg uh, wrote the opinion of the unanimous court. And she provided that states must draw congressional districts with populations as close to perfect equality as possible, congressional districts, but when drawing state and local legislative districts, jurisdictions are permitted to deviate somewhat from perfect population equality to accommodate traditional districting objectives, among them preserving the integrity of political subdivisions, maintaining communities of interest, and creating geographic compactness. And where the population, the maximum population deviation between your largest district and your smallest district is less than 10%, a local legislative map is going to presumptively comply with the one person, one vote principle of the United States Constitution. So now let's talk about our current districts, um, which do not comport with state or federal law. Tracy, could you uh, pull up, it's Exhibit A. Perfect. Thank you. So this is a snapshot of our current district, and I say they don't comport with state and federal law, and that's a very natural thing. That's why we're having this conversation. Um, because from a community like Fishers, we've experienced an immense amount of growth over the last 10 years, and in particular, an immense amount of growth to the eastern portion of our community. As you look at what's being reflected as our current district's Exhibit A to this ordinance, um, a couple things to point out. Right now, as we currently sit, if the maps weren't adjusted, our northeast district, which is district number six, uh, would be our largest district and our smallest district would be the South Central District, which is district number four. The disparity between the two districts is almost 38%. So remember, we just went through an analysis that said we have to be less than 10% to be presumptively valid, and here our largest district has outgrown our smallest district by almost 38%. There's a similar disparity between our Northeast District, district number six, and our Northwest District, which is district number two. Approximately four districts as we sit today are greater or less than 10% from our target population. Again, just reflecting that change needs to be made. And then from a high level perspective, the snapshot makes sense with the considerable growth out east. We have our northeast district, district number six on the map, and our southeast district, district number one, containing the greatest populations as we sit today. Um, and in summary, our, our current legislative districts do not comply. So uh, Tracy, could you go back and now um, post exhibit B to the maps? Thank you. So a review of these proposed maps um, from the onset, uh, I'm just here to tell you that they comport with Indiana and federal law. Um, one important thing to note is that these proposed maps do not cross precinct boundary lines. So there is an analysis in which you're allowed to cross and break up precincts. Uh, however, there's a heightened level of scrutiny that's applied under uh, state law and you also have to uh, get those in with Hamilton County uh, prior to an effective date. So these proposed maps do not break up any precincts as you know them. And the general issue that you have with your precinct blocks as you may know, is that precincts and fissures aren't made up of precinct blocks of 100 people or 200 people, but instead they're made up of 1,000 people or 1,500 or 2,000 people in some instances. So population shifts from one precinct from one district to another has kind of a domino effect on every district and having to move those around. Following trends of population growth from these proposed districts, uh, District 2, which is the Northwest District, District 5, the Southwest District, and District 4, the South Central District, grow east, where the population trends are taking them. By doing so, District 6, which is our Northeast District, and today our largest population, and District 1, which is our Southeast uh, District, and second largest population, give up those precincts to accommodate the growth. And District 3, uh, the North Central District, by population total was the closest population to our target goal today as we sit. So there's very little change to that. There is a, an accommodation of growth from District 2 growing out east and flipping a precinct to accommodate that growth. Um, these proposed maps have been reviewed by the Hamilton County Elections Office uh, and, and they saw no issue. 
uh, with not crossing the precincts and did a spot check on the numbers as well. Again, I will tell you tonight's first reading. We have started hearing from residents. I know this gentleman uh, came who was speaking during the budget presentation uh, from Gray Eagle. We've heard from some residents in Gray Eagle about the proposed maps as well. Tonight is just first reading. We have on our website tonight, we have put up a community comment section. So as you all know, for council meetings, we have a community comment section uh, that allows residents to give us their input on council agenda items. There's now a specific drop box for council redistricting where residents uh, between now and our next meeting can go and submit their opinions so that the council can take those under advisement and bring it back here for final reading in October. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I, I had heard from three residents, well, I heard multiple residents via email today from Gray Eagle, and then I spoke with three of them and had very good conversations. And, and really, you know, they're, they're, the concern, the main concern was, that was presented to me was, they would like to have one, you know, representative to, to speak to regarding, uh, regarding items. I did remind them that there are three at-large members as well, and so that's, that gets you to four. Um, if it were to be split up, and I, under, I do understand the conf there could be confusion or who do we talk to or we want to really you know, consolidate and, and talk to one person. If there's two representatives, how this is currently um, proposed, you then have five individuals, right? You'd have two council members, district, uh, that would be representing that neighborhood, right? I mean, split in the areas, and then you'd have three at large. So just something to take into consideration, because I didn't get to speak to everybody. I did, re I did reply to as many emails as I could get to, um, but I appreciated the comments and feedback, but I did, hear, I did hear that, and that was the only district that I heard of issues. So I don't know other you know, council members, feel free to share things, but that was the, the district I heard from. Uh, since that's my district, <coughs> um, as I have uh, expressed, and I, I wasn't aware of this till recently, uh, Gray Eagle is very important to me. I worked with them very hard for years, along with the mayor uh, and the developer. I don't want to give up Gray Eagle, uh, given half to one and half to another. Uh, I have sent a proposal to you guys that would keep Gray Eagle in my district but keep within the 10 percent um, and i have also sent that to the election office uh, for their approval too so i am against what you have proposed uh, for my district and sure. i'm the one that's affected the most so uh, and i'm happy to take that under advisement councilman Dureman. if you send me those comments directly i'll look at it um, you do have the largest district so keeping gray eagle will have an effect on the rest of the maps and so we would have to figure out Give whether up, the yeah, rest of those I can maps give can up Fall Creek out. 24 and Fall Creek 27, and I'm back within my 10%. Uh, and I'll, I'll take those and review those and present yeah. them to the council for your and Fall Creek 24 will help the, uh, di the middle district, which is the lowest. Mm -hmm. That will help that district. And Pete doesn't mind giving up some of his. So thanks. Give Thank you. Some more. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Chris, who was responsible for the um, creation of these proposed maps. Yeah, so our GIS team, Melissa Brenneman, uh, put this map together, and she worked directly with Hamilton County, uh, their GIS person, and their elections office to take the natural growths into effect, and then ultimately they're up to you. Um, right, but um, just to be clear, it was not a bipartisan process. It was a, a city employee. I just want to be clear about what the process sure. was. Mm -hmm. The... Um, Current maps, they were attached as part of the agenda that came out on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, how can citizens review them? And the, um, thank you for having the, the printouts. It's not very detailed, it's hard to, sure. I mean, frankly, I received all the comments from Great Eagle residents and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that. Sure. So, 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 so my question is how can citizens, I appreciate yeah. the feedback option, yeah. how can, all of us reviewed these maps. Sure. So um, additionally, in a beyond way. The, the aggregate map that you see up here, we also have a series map that breaks each voting district um, in more detail. 
So for example, you can have a more zoomed in view of District 6, District 1, et cetera. So we'll be able to provide those. And then there's also a map that has a precinct layer over it. So you can see the precincts within the general districts that we can provide as well. Can you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I followed that. Yeah. So what will or is made available right now? We have right those available now? and we'll make those available for the general public consumption after this meeting. Um, like on the website? Yeah. That folks can zoom in and take a, take a look. Okay, thank yep. you. And um, the the deadline to have these approved is when? Buyer before November eighth. So, so if unless we create a special city council meeting to approve these, they have to be approved by the next city council meeting That's in October. Correct. And is there a public hearing that is involved with us? There's not. How will, well, I'm sorry, one last question. Um, this is new to us and, um, well, at least, no one's been here for 10 years, have they? Of course, <laughs> thank you, Pete. You've been, you've been through this, this is new for me, this is new for me. Um, how will, um, uh, ultimately, I just wanna be clear about this process and I'm sure you appreciate it, sensitive. This body determines the final maps, Correct. approves the final maps. How does this body get the information or the feedback from citizens then? How, how do we get informed by the citizens if there's no public hearing and we have just a few weeks to get this done? So again, we're gonna have a comment section on our website that citizens can inform us and can inform you. If you have specific recommended changes that you would like to see of these maps, or you'd like to see us run some sort of an analysis of these maps, we can bring them back and show you whether they comport with state law or not. Ultimately, it's a policy decision of this body to determine the maps, right? But a change in a precinct may not work because of the effect that it has on the rest of the city maps. So there's an analysis that has to go forward. Our GIS folks are, are comfortable running those analysis. So I, I think through Council President uh, Zimmerman's leadership, he could probably filter a way to receive comments from the council to send them back to our team and have the GIS folks run those as you see accordingly. So if we could have those, as uh, Brad has submitted uh, some some items, and if, if any of you have I you know feedback that you're getting, mm -hmm. let's funnel that in, and then and then I'll we'll coordinate with Chris and get those back to you as soon as possible. Just and it won't be two days before the next council meeting. Thank we'll get you. that. We'll get yeah. that the Thank next you. one, Chris. You know, within a week or so, and then sure. we have plenty of time to dissect that. Also, those maps you can zoom down to street level. Right? They'll be yeah, I believe so. In the, in the precinct specific maps, right. or the district specific, I should say, right. you're able to zoom in on a much granular okay. level. Yep. Thanks, Todd. Yep. Absolutely. That, that sounds like a great pro pro good process moving forward. So thank you. Absolutely. And Crystal, what I what I noticed in this is, or, and Selena, so mm -hmm. for both of your current districts, um, the downtown area of Fishers shifted from John, excuse me, John's district to Right, so that, yeah, and then, um, and that affects just Selene in the sense of what, where that would fall in and make sure that those, they didn't carve anything out of District 2, correct? On that downtown from the current? I don't no, believe. Yeah. I, don't I believe, believe the, the current block is the, that downtown. The downtown, downtown changed, downtown but changed. it was, so it was four. So again, if I can, yeah. and I've been very, and this happened the last time we did this too. We need to refer to these by geographic location, yes. Yes. not numbers. numbers yep. Okay, the numbers make no sense at all. They never have. So when we refer to them, you've got southeast, northeast, north central, south central, southwest, and northwest. Sure. It's the only way you're going to describe this effectively for the population to understand where the hell we're talking. Yeah, about. we do need to adjust that on the next. If we could do that, I'll be on the happy next to map. do that. It was, I, it was very difficult. To I, I do have one yes. last question, just another detail. When do these maps take effect? Upon approval. So they would take effect upon approval. That's a great question. Um, we, within 30 days of approval, have to forward these to the county elections office. They go through their process, so it's a matter of when they make them official within their own office. But we're responsible for approving them, submitting them to the county within 30 days of that approval. And I'll give it a first reading. Any, any other questions or comments? I, I just received emails from Gray Eagle as well, and I responded and called, and and so I think some of them are here mm -hmm. most likely to make comments here at the end of the meeting. 
So, and you're welcome to, so those residents of Gray Eagle that are here, we have a community comment uh, section here on the agenda. You're more than welcome to speak. I'm not trying to tell you not to. Please feel free to speak. However, we have heard loud and clear from a lot of emails and phone calls. So that is something that now with the first reading, we're gonna go back and take a look at. And then what we'll do is, I think what we need to do is communicate with the HOA yeah, there yeah. about kind of our process. Is that, Brad, would you feel that that's fair? And we'll, so we'll communicate through the HOA so they can get that out to the Gray Eagle residents uh, that are, in, you know, that feel like, hey, yay or nay on this. And so at least we have, you, you know you're gonna have follow up and you don't have to rely on all of us to reply to you know your emails, all the, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, for, and we forget somebody, right? If we happen to not forget somebody right. in that process, so that Brad, does that seem fair to? Okay. And and I'm yeah. sorry, one last thing. Um, I'm not quite certain how Great Eagle was notified. I'm glad they were, but I'm I'm certain they're probably the only HOA that has been notified. Uh, thank you, Brad. I'm I'm just saying I don't think this is well known in our community that this is happening at all and I'm glad Great Eagle knows about it but that's why I think 100% of the <coughs> comments we've received so far from Great Eagle I think that that is the only um, neighborhood that has been uh, informed. I think we have a communication process with HOAs currently right I'm not saying we did about this particular thing but we do have I, mean, I recommend and if you can I mean disagree with me or not I, I recommend just communicating hey We've got this out there. Once we get this, um, and it, so we can get some some feedback if there's any other concerns out there. Okay. So let the HOAs know. I would rather them know, and and you know, and then if if they don't have any problem with it, then that's fine. We probably won't hear from people, but some people might be interested in some input. Anything else on on this? We got first reading. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank All right. You. Thank you. We're on 29, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Item 29091922L. Again, for the record, Chris Greisel, City Attorney, presenting on an ordinance uh, of the city amending uh, Section 3530 of the City of Fishers Code of Ordinances uh, regarding permit reinspection fees. So, this council may recall we started uh, this conversation over the summer through some extensive work sessions with our building code enforcement folks. Uh, planning and zoning folks regarding inspection fees and various issues that we're experiencing in the field uh, regarding uh, fines, penalties, the reassessment of fines, et cetera. Uh, I think there was a general consensus uh, from this body during that work session to pursue an amendment uh, to those codes um, to, to increase those fees, and, and that's what you have before you here today. Um, the amendment is simply... Um, Section 3530, uh, there's a schedule, a fee chart, and I realize now that I didn't have the red line of the fee chart, but I'll go over that with you here, and I'll be happy to put a red line together for next reading. But essentially, you have a, a first reinspection fee, which to date is $75, a second reinspection fee, which is $150 today, and a third reinspection fee, which is $500 today. We went back, taking the consideration from the council and adjusted those uh, to a $125 first inspection fee, so that's $75 to $125. A second reinspection fee marked up to $300 from previously $150, and a third reinspection fee at $750 marked up from previously $500. If you recall, these reinspection re fees are with respect to the same permit and the same inspection issue. So these aren't different trades. This is the builder failing the same permit multiple times and not correcting action. And so today under this proposed uh, guidance, he would, this builder would be hit with a first reinspection fee of $125, a second reinspection fee of $300, a third or subsequent reinspection fee of $750, and then there's uh, the ability for our building commissioner to issue a stop work order which carries a fine and also carries um, subsequent reinspection fees as well. Um, beyond the fees, right before the meeting, I had a comment from Councilwoman Vare about, if you recall, during our conversations during work session, the council talked about bringing a process forward where when we have a redevelopment or a development of a residential area, 
having the city being able to provide some stats regarding um, inspection fees or fines associated with that builder or developer, and we're happy to do that. That doesn't need a legislative fix. The only thing that needs a legislative fix is this amendment that's before you. If it's the council's direction, the uh, administration would be happy to start adding that data uh, to our residential developments that would be brought before you. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd also point out that the city did notify Baggy of uh, these inspections. We met with them. Uh, we provided them uh, a draft of this first reading. So the fees, the reinspection fees, they would not be discretionary, correct? So it would, it would be correct. tiered up and 700 is the max and then it continues? After 750 is 750, the max. 750, excuse mm -hmm. me, okay. Is the stop work order discretionary? The stop work order um, is not, it, it can be discretionary. So what what happens after a subsequent reinspection is you have a seven hundred and fifty dollar fine after the third failed reinspection. The builder then has up to five days, as it's currently written, to get that implemented. Kind of a five day last chance before that stop work order. So there is a five day buffer period before that stop work right. order becomes non discretionary. Okay, so after five days and it's non-discretionary, there is no, That's so we correct. can't treat one person differently than the other. That's correct. There's a system and a path forward, just like there has been today. The only difference is that the fines have been increased. I'll give a first reading. Yeah, on the stop, is that stop on the subdivision or just that one house? No, it's just on that one house on that one permit. Is there any way we can put a stop on the entire subdivision to get there? I don't believe so, not from a legal perspective. I think it's tied to the permit because they have a property right in that permit and you're taking that away for a violation of that permit. Okay. Anyone else, questions, comments? Okay, we'll have a first reading. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on, we have no uh, unfinished or new business. We'll move on to community comment section. We'll open it up for uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to speak? Step forward, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Board, gentlemen, I, I uh, will give you an apology. I didn't know that you weren't finished. You came over here and sat down and uh, and uh, I just thought you were finished. <laughs> and thank you for correcting me. <clears throat> My name is Theodore Moran, uh, 13021 Duval Drive, mm -hmm. Fishers, 462037. Uh, it's between Brook School and the first major crossroad uh, that runs through the golf course there. And uh, I, when I first moved in there, I went to the uh, uh, tax assessor's office because I thought that the tax amount was too much and they informed me not only one two three people in that office told me that all of the gray eagle was under the same tax consideration so my question is when uh, everybody gets this thing all uh, divvied up here, the districts. Uh, is my tax rate gonna go down or up? It would be the exact same. And it why? Does, it, it has no implication. Excuse me, on, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, yep. If it's a different district, uh, why wouldn't the people in the next district who live in primarily uh, uh, two-story homes, and we live in a one-story home, 
why would uh, uh, that's not fair in, in my opinion so uh, I apologize to the board that I didn't come with any more information I got this information this afternoon that this meeting was going to occur but the next time I will be prepared well, thank and, you very much. and uh, hopefully uh, my wife and I uh, will uh, uh, make a joint presentation at that point. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yep, thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Anyone else wishing to speak, step forward and state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, hello, everybody. Jack Russell, president of One Zone Chamber of Commerce. Um, Hello, everybody. I know all of you, so it's nice to see you all. Um, so I'm here tonight because of all the things. Uh, obviously, this has been a long meeting, but you have $1.1 billion redistricting a budget. Um, and so when we look at that $1.1 billion, it's amazing. Uh, us, we serve 1,400 members, making us the fourth largest chamber in the state of Indiana. Over 400 of our members are Fisher's businesses. And so when we look at, uh, you know, the word we've used tonight is transformational. Um, when I joined One Zone almost five years ago, uh, we were in a little white house off of Allisonville Road, and we moved our office to downtown Fishers, and we found ourselves in the middle of transformation uh, with Browning, with First Internet Bank, uh, with the, Fish the Fishers District. And now to see the Fishers District begin to take on its own piece uh, again, and continue to grow, I think you're going to see uh, with this event center uh, even more excitement around that. But more importantly, uh, and a portion of this is obviously that food and beverage tax, something that we do support uh, at the Chamber of Commerce as well. But uh, I promise I wanted to keep it very, very brief, but you will hear from all of us. You'll begin to hear from our businesses. I'm sure you have already heard from our businesses. Um, but as Mayor Fadden has said, and being able to work with this amazing team, the word transformational, our businesses want to continue that transformation. We want to continue building off of Browning, First Internet. We want to build off Fisher's District. We want to continue to do those things because our businesses want it. They're so proud to call Fisher's home. Uh, Mayor Fadness and I, when I became president, we spoke for two hours at Four Day Ray, and, and one of the things we talked about was uh, as we begin to be transformational, bringing our small businesses along with that. And we have truly found that our businesses, our small businesses, are finding ways that they can get engaged with not only the amphitheater and downtown, you've got all these brand new businesses that are coming along in our downtown, but also now Fisher's District. It's just unbelievable. And so I want to say thank you to Megan and Mayor Fadness and all of you. Uh, for what you're doing but as you guys continue through this process understand that the business community is here and we hear it and we want to continue this progress it's so important for us so thank you thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much anyone else wishing to speak step forward state your name and address for the record you have three minutes to speak see no one stepping forward i'll close the community comment section you know make a motion, a motion to adjourn second. yeah hold on hold on one second brad i have a comment and if, if chief uh, the Richmond police officer, Sierra Burton, that got shot weeks ago, uh, one week before her wedding, and then was declared brain dead. Uh, the family uh, decided to remove support system, and she kept breathing. Unfortunately, um, she died last night at 9.59 p.m. keep hearing these things it's just constant it seems to continue broken record and something's got to change in our society so with that uh, motion, motion to adjourn, to adjourn. Second. second we are adjourned thank you for all have your patience and coming out